of patience. We are getting started now. We just had to wait for a few more people to join us. Can I request all of you sitting in the back rows to please come forward, join us in the front. And can we please switch to my display, to my laptop, please? Yeah, the first rows are also vacant. So, welcome back. Day two and uh, last part of our conference. Very nice to have you all. Uh, just wanted to do a quick check um, with Slido and uh, let's go over to that. And this is also going to be something to get us started. It's like I thought it would be a fun thing to do. Um, yeah. So it's very simple. Uh, just wanted to go to Slido and uh, see if you can start building the story. That's already the first line of the story. Uh, I just want you to all continue the story. What would your second line to this story be? And doesn't have to be necessarily about the circular economy, it can be anything else, but uh, let your imagination run wild and let's see what comes up on screen. And this can be a sort of crowdsource story. <laughs> yeah, please feel free to type that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need to type it in, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the same thing as yesterday, go to slider.com and you can sign up or you can scan the QR code use the event code circular or the passcode and that will take you there hi welcome why don't you join us a bit up front we still have a lot more space here please come front thank you so for the ones who just joined us um, we just got started a very simple uh, exercise with our online tool Slido uh, where we're just asking everyone to build a crowdsource story. So the first line was once upon a time and then it's up to you to continue adding your line to it. Let's see what comes up. It's nice. <laughs> People lived in harmony. It's all still very, very polite and uh, <laughs> Oh, nice. Okay, an Aussie came to New Delhi. <laughs> nice. Now we are talking. Now we are talking. A coordinated effort of all stakeholders. Good. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Planet full of love. Nice. Everyone busy with their phones, yeah. That's a very meta statement. <laughs> You're using your phone to type that. Circle was only a shape. I'm still waiting for the NIMBY and SIMBY to kick in <laughs> from, from our discussions yesterday. <laughs> Great, all of us had good food and thoughts, danced well. <laughs> A whole lot of love in there. It's good to see that. Scales will need to tip towards the circle. Ominous. <laughs> <laughs> Exchange ideas, concepts, great. H humans did not rule the planet. I'm guessing that came from you, Sharon. <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> Circulation starts on the ground. Oh, yeah, Nimbu and Nimsi. <laughs> 
We need t-shirts with these acronyms, guys. It's badly. <laughs> need to get back to tribalism. Interesting. <laughs> Great, I'll keep that open and you can keep adding to it and you know we can look back at it uh, around lunch and see <laughs> what's the story that we created together. It's always fun. Thank you so much for working with me on this. Let's go to today's program, Learning Labs. So um, this is going to be a really fun session. We have a couple of um, super interesting speakers. The focus is really on tools, toolkits, and frameworks that are useful in the circularity uh, context for cities. So I'm very happy to uh, welcome some of our speakers here. This is the lineup that we have for you today. Um, we have uh, Apurva from Circle Economy, Shruti Sadhu Khan from Ikle, uh, Mona, who's joining us uh, remotely uh, from Holsim, Sharon from UNEP and George from the City of Hume, Australia. Uh, let's give them a big hand. Really cool to have such great speakers here today. So uh, without much ado, let's uh, get started. Um, can we start uh, with you, Apurva? I'll get your presentation up. So there you go. Sorry. Wait, no, they don't see you. Um, Switch to us. Well. This is your view. Okay, I haven't used honestly Google, Google Slides, honestly. Okay. Uh, hold on. So usually. But normally you get the speaker notes down here, right? Yeah. But if I so usually I just do a slideshow and then I go to presenter view, and okay. then I can see my presentation and they can see. Like here, it's basically. No, it's not working here. It's not working here, right? No. Okay. Cool. Um, you can also just use this model. Yeah, so it's fine. that's fine. Okay. Okay. Um. Slide two. No, that is, but I have to see the notes. What do I have to see? Speaker notes. अच्छा Okay, work It's okay. No worries. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning and welcome to day two of today's session. Um, it's great to see you all again. So, my name is Apurva and I'm a labor market consultant working in Circle Economy. Um, so, today I'm going to be talking about the circularity gap report for cities. And um, to start off within the eight minutes that I've been given, uh, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about circle economy and our work. Um, following that, I'll be talking about the circularity gap reporting initiative for cities, the tool that uh, we're looking at today. And then I'm also going to be talking about looking ahead and um, you know, what you can explore further. 
So um, the first part of, is about Circle Economy and our work. So Circle Economy is an impact organization that is based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And um, what we do is uh, we connect and empower a, a global community to create conditions for systemic transformations. So we work uh, with various stakeholders and help them create roadmaps and ac action plans for a circular future. Um, so we've been in this space for about 10 years and what our vision is, um, is that we want to contribute to, to a pos prosperous world of finite resources by accelerating the transition to a circular economy. And in order to do this, um, you know, we want to deliver practical and scalable circular eco economy solutions to the world. To the world sounds really large, but basically we work with, um, you know, stakeholders across various contexts. And right now, um, our focus has been more in the European region, but we're really also working uh, in diversifying our context and working across different geographies as well. So this is our approach. As I said, we work with businesses, nations, and cities, and we guide them towards a circular system. And how we do this is we use data and practical evidence to create roadmaps for action and informing decision making. So this is just a snapshot of the experience that we have. So we worked with over 120 businesses, uh, 51 cities, 23 nations. Um, we've collected over 3,000 case studies in Knowledge Hub, which is an open uh, uh, resource that is accessible to everyone. So if you want to deep dive more into examples of circular economy in practice, you can also look at this resource. We have trained over 2,700 people and published over 70 plus reports since uh, 2016. And um, so one of our flagship pro products is the Circularity Gap Reporting Initiative. Um, and this is a report that we publish every year since 2018. And what we've done through this is we measure how circular the world is. Um, and we have a rigorous methodology to do this as well. You can find the information online. But I wanted to ask you all a question here. Um, how circular do you think our world is this year? So we just launched this report um, in, 2000, uh, in January 2023. Um, and I see some smiles there. Maybe some of you know already. Yeah, you've read <laughs> okay, some of you have read it. Any guesses from someone who has no idea? Do you want to take a venture guess? Yes. 10%? Okay. Anyone else? Some 8%. Yeah, okay. So um, when we launched this report for the first time in 2018, we found that the, uh, the circularity gap was at 9.1%. And this year, we find that it's at 7.2%. So what we see is that the gap is increasing and uh, how circular we are is basically going down. And what this means is that there are lesser resources that we are cycling back. More than 90% of the resources that we consume are not cycled back. So this is a real issue that we are facing, right? Um, so what we do is, um, I just spoke about the first uh, set of reports that we, that we generate. That is the circularity gap report at the global level. So that's an annual report that we generate. We also do this at a national level. So what we do is, across different uh, you know, uh, nations, for instance, we did it for Amsterdam, and we found that Amsterdam was 24.3% circular. Uh, we also worked with Norway and we did a similar study. So the, at the national level, we do a similar analysis where we try and un uh, identify how circular a nation is, right? And the next level is that is taking it basically to a city level. And this is what we are launching this year. And this is what I'm uh, speaking about today. So we are in 2023 launching the first circularity gap uh, analysis for the city of Munich. So uh, Munich, the, the Munich metropolitan area in Germany, right? And um, so, so moving on to that, why are we doing this for cities, right? Why are we, uh, you know, scaling like from the national level? Why are we now bringing it down to a city level? And I think the rationale for this is pretty obvious. We've had a day of detailed discussions yesterday where we've really established how cities are the epicenter of the transition. And in order to be able to actually move towards circular solutions, we also need to make sure that local stakeholders are aware of what the gaps are and how they can be bridged. So the data and evidence part is a really important uh, component of this transition. And we also discussed that in the, uh, the sessions in the morning and afternoon as well. So uh, this is the rationale for why we want to uh, dive down to the city level, right? And how does this exactly work? 
So what we're going to be doing is these are the different steps broadly that will be followed. So the first thing is we map the resources across the economy, right? So we understand what, uh, what the resources are across the economy. Then we identify what are the hotspots of intervention through data. That's the next step. We then look at scenario analysis where we try and understand what is the potential uh, impact of circular economy interventions in specific sectors. So then we, so at this level we're diving down into the sector level analysis. And then of course comes a step of informing local stakeholders how and where you know, there are uh, potentials for intervention. And then finally, it's about creating a common, uh, a, a common plan towards action. And all this is done, of course, through an extremely collaborative process with, at both uh, you know, the national level as well as the local level. Um, so this is more of a uh, you know, nationally-led approach. So it starts, sorry, at, uh, 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 when I say nationally-led, I mean a top-bottom approach. So it starts, uh, it's more top-down. and. Um, yeah, these are the steps uh, that we follow, right? Um, so what we do exactly is that, um, and here I'm going to zoom out a little bit and look in my notes. So we, we look, uh, we basically, uh, you can see a Sankey diagram over here, and what this does it is, is provides an X-ray of uh, the, a city's economy visualizing how four material groups uh, feed into meeting societal needs, right? So here we see four groups. We see biomass, which is the green. We see non-metallic minerals in purple. We see fossil fuels in blue. And we see metal ores in orange. So what is the first step is really trying to understand how these different uh, groups, these four material groups, meet societal needs, right? Um, what we also do is, we complement then this analysis with a circularity economic indicator framework that cities can use to measure and track their progress. So once we understand uh, what the impact is on societal needs, we also look at what indicators are required to be measured and uh, you know, derive those so that they can also be uh, standardized across you know, different uh, bodies that are doing this analysis. Then what we do is, once we uh, do the material flow and circular economy indicators analysis uh, to create a baseline picture of the status of circular economy, we also conduct a scenario analysis to identify what are the hotspots of inter intervention, right? And we measure the potential impact of the material footprint of the city, the carbon footprint, and the overall effect that it could have on increasing the circularity metric. So that's what you see over here. So just to reiterate, after the material flow and circularity economic uh, economy indicator analysis, we then move on to this step, that is identifying hotspots for intervention and measuring impact. Right? So in this way, the idea is to allow the city government to select the most appropriate circular economy strategies um, and, and you know, zoom in to the ones that would create the largest impact. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, a very co-creative co uh, stakeholder-based approach. And we really uh, make sure that we work with a diverse group of local stakeholders and coalitions on the ground. So for instance, um, you know, we work with the project team, we work with a metropolitan level project team, which has uh, various stakeholders. We also have the Circularity Gap Report Metropolitan Region Coalition, who also feeds into this. And we also have an endorsement panel um, who, who also make sure that, you know, we are staying on track, who, else, who also ensure that we, um, we get the messaging across right. So now, quickly, um, looking that I'm also out of time, um, I'm going to quickly talk about what the next steps are. So first of all, this is just a snapshot of the work that we do. We also offer other tools. We have the Circle City Scan. We have the Circle Carbon Scan. This, the third one is the one I just spoke about. We also do workshops in capacity development. And we also have digital tools for cities. All this information is available on our website. If you go to uh, you know, cities under Circle Economy, you will find all of these. And you can also read more details about how the different methodologies work. All of this is open source, so it can be replicated as well. Um, and as I mentioned, you can also go to Knowledge Hub if you want to learn more about inspiring circular uh, you know, initiatives from around the world. There's also information on our Knowledge Hub. And uh, yeah, basically, we want more cities to join us in this effort in measuring circularity. So come join us and um, find us on circleeconomy.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Apoorva. Um, 
Can I just uh, get to slide up <coughs> in a bit? And uh, we can take some questions, but let's do that um, through Slido. Give me a moment. Uh, you have water here. So, yeah, Bharat, you have a question? Uh, good morning. I am Bharat Nagar from GIZ. So, I just wanted to ask you why you are not including water as a, you know, indicator of circular economy? Is it like water, uh, like you are focusing more towards the carbon footprint of the materials or? Because I could see biomass, minerals and then Uh, you can come back to use the mic. Yeah, so those are the four material flows that we look at. Um, in terms of water, to be honest, I have to check back on this and get back to you. So I can I can check on this and get back to you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to your question. Thank you. I put myself into the, shoe, into the shoes of a city council mm -hmm. and I would like to, let's say, request your service to make this sort of analysis in my city. <coughs> How can I do that? What is the price? Is there a sort of fund behind? What are the costs? Blah, blah, blah. And what do you need from me? And what, what would you do in case that my data situation is somehow critical? I cannot deliver all the data you need. Yeah, so I think in terms of um, estimating what the price is, I think that also what we do is uh, once there's an interest from a city, we then sit down with them to understand what the situation of data is, how much data is already available, how much it would, rec how much would require extrapolation as well as mapping and using best guess estimates. And um, then considering the holistic picture, we basically will then be able to provide a quote from the, from, to the city council. Um, in terms of what we require from them, as I mentioned, I think this process is very collaborative. So we really work very closely with city level stakeholders. And um, so we'll also involve, of course, an estimation of understanding what their input is and what their time is um, and making sure we have appropriate support from the different stakeholders. Um, so in terms of the budget, I can't say that there's a fixed uh, amount that we have. It really depends on what the, the city size is, what, uh, you know, what data is available and all of those. So to be honest, for this particular one, this is we've only starting it out now in Munich for one city. So uh, there's not really a benchmark uh, to say how much it would approximately cost. Um, so if any city is interested in, in you know, reaching out to us, we can work with them more closely and give them an estimate. Right now, we don't have enough data points to say this is the estimated amount for doing a circularity gap report for a city, if that makes sense. Munich is paying that from its, its own pocket, or is there sort of a donor sponsorship? Um, I will check and get back to you. I think, yeah. I will check and get back to you on that. So uh, also to be honest, this is not a project um, that I am working on directly. So I'm supporting the city team on working on this project. So my, uh, I, I work as part of the circular jobs team in circular economy. So uh, we work collaborating with the city, city's team and where we come in is when we do the analysis, we also look at what are the employment impacts. Um, and so that's where we really specialize on this. So that's why some of your questions, I will direct them to the city team and get back to you on those. Thank you. Thank you, Apurva, for the presentation. I'm Kosadinos from Living Prospects. So my question is, uh, you presented the tools uh, which appear to be very transparent. The question is, 
is they also available, the methodology is available for the city to use them themselves with their resources? So yeah. do you provide them with, a, let's say, a workshop or some uh, details on how to perform this task themselves? If they're not, to complement what Holger said, if they do not have the resources to, to finance them themselves. Yeah, so as part of all the offerings that we provide, there's also capacity development is very much, uh, goes very much along with it because again, the idea is that at the end of the process, uh, you know, we capacitate city level stakeholders to be able to implement and continue on this analysis by themselves. So definitely it's also part of it. And since this is the first analysis we'll be doing, the methodology and um, uh, all the analysis will also be for available openly so it can be, uh, you know, replicated as well. So this will be available once it's complete and published. If you see also, uh, you know, the other reports that we publish, all the methodologies are also uh, available online. And if you require further information, you can even reach out to our team and we can share more details with you. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks a lot. Yes. Hi. So I'm Aarti from Sahas. My question is again regarding the methodology. Uh, that uh, when you talk about uh, the material <coughs> flows, uh, there is a lot uh, more ambiguity regarding what is considered as a uh, strict definition of, say, how the material is flowing. For example, uh, say, recycling is a very vague term. Some countries or uh, places <coughs> they might consider exporting the waste or incinerating as a way of recycling. So do you follow some kind of uh, established definitions to establish those material flows? Or uh, is it is it based on what the city considers as? So I think um, in terms of material flows, we do have um, you know standard definitions that we that we follow. So um, one more point to mention is that our uh, city scan, which is uh, which is a product that we offered offered uh, which we also offer. <coughs> is a lot more tailored to cities and what the requirements of cities are and so the methodology is not cannot be really uh, you know rigorously compared across cities so that's another uh, reason for also introducing now the circularity gap report for cities because we want to create a more standardized methodology that can also allow more cross compatibility so um, in terms of the measurement as well this will be more standardized across cities as well um, i think there was a question from you as well uh, Vishay, you had a question, right? Yeah. <coughs> good, evening, uh, good morning. So, I'm a very commendable uh, presentation so far. I really Thank liked you. it. So, Thank you. Uh, I just have an abstract question of sorts. So, uh, we've heard of this new concept called 15-minute uh, cities, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, in a city, within like 15 minutes, you'll have all essential services and all <coughs> essential public transportation around you. So, uh, do you feel it actually builds towards circularity or is it a hindrance? Because it it is a good concept in in theory, but how would you uh, if if it is good for circularity, how would you implement <coughs> it? So, I think in terms of circularity as well, and you know, designing a city, I think that's why also the conversations we had uh, yesterday afternoon with the governance and urban uh, planning session is also I think really relevant. So while access to essential infrastructure and, and all of that is of course extremely important i think in also designing and planning our cities it's really important to think up front as we're designing itself what are the different um, you know levers to consider in order to enable um, this to align with the circularity agenda because the, the truth is of course access and um, inclusivity is really important but i think it's also about finding that sweet spot between thinking of social, economic, and environmental impacts. And I think positioning circularity in the midst of all of that and finding that balance is really important. Um, any further questions? Uh, maybe one question to the city officials who are present, to the city commissioners. Um, how would you see some tool like this? What is your way of working? Are you, do you use any tools like these or what would your interest in such a tool be? Maybe, sir, from, from Kambitur, do you have a comment? I can Good morning. Uh, it's a good uh, presentation, basically. But uh, the tools are, everything is in paper, but uh, the 
there are practical difficulties also uh, because more of uh, informal sectors are there so we have to make it formalized and then we have to assess the real potential basically like we, we are uh, all working on an abstract things maybe these kind of tools if it is implemented properly would be there even i was asking uh, this kabadi wala connect i was actually telling them to assess properly like uh, how much waste is there and what are the inform how many people are actually into the formal and informal sector so after that this tool would be very helpful for uh, the cities i hope Thank but you. do you see it integrating in your way of working or what is the gap there what needs to happen for something like this tool to also <coughs> be adopted in your workflow no it, uh, i don't think the tool will be uh, same for every cities because yeah. every city will have to be fine tuned yeah. based on the actual requirements yeah. so that's how it Okay yep. thank you very much and i think you touch upon a very important point as well which is informality right and the fact that in different countries also the levels of informality the data availability is very different and uh, of course we completely acknowledge this also that when we work across different contexts we really make sure that we tailor our methodology and we also understand before we dive into a geography what the requirements are what the availability is um because often when we talk about circular solutions as well we have to be very careful in ensuring that we don't override systems that already exist and it doesn't uh, you know lead to any sort of uh, disruption of like the local ecosystem so definitely that's a very important point and we also work with those considerations always yeah awesome thank you so much on that note let's move to the next presentation yeah if uh, you had another question i can also oh uh, yeah oh yeah okay you had a question yes I just want to come back to the figure of 7.1 percent. Yeah. Let's say yeah. sort of decrease compared to what happened in 2018. It was 8.7 uh, or almost 9. Yeah. yeah. What is the major explanation for that? Me between in the pandemic, some deinvestments, or what is what is let's say the major explanation? So I think the major um, explanation for that is that material consumption is just increasing rapidly, along with. um i mean the fact that we are also seeing population growth it's just that we we have an increasing material consumption there are certain sectors that are really contributing to um the circular economy far more than other sectors for instance built environment is one um you know mobility and transport is another one energy is another one so the, in these sectors we really see that they are the largest contributors to uh, the whole you know circularity gap and if we intervene in just these three or four key sectors we can already see a huge uh, improvement in our circularity metric so i think it's it really just boils down to um, you know, increasing consumption which is just yeah exponentially increasing okay thank you so much apurva thank you so much for presentation thanks a lot another big hand please So let's head over now to our uh, virtual speaker who's joining us. Just give me a moment. Um, can we switch to hybrid, please? Ah, hi, Mona. Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, can perfect. You see me? So wonderful uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Mona Jaluk from Holsim, and uh, she's going to be talking about the Circular Cities Barometer. Um so feel free to introduce yourself Mona and uh, give us a really nice overview of what the circular cities barometer is all about on to you Sure uh is my presentation up on screen already or should I share my screen Uh not yet you can share your screen please Ah okay yeah. let me do this then And we can hear you oh. loud and clear really good audio Okay I'm a bit Oh god this is a uh, I'm seeing myself triple now it's very Disturbing <laughs> at such an early time of the day. Okay, is that working for you? Uh, yes, um, we see the presentation. Yes. Let's see if I can. Oh, just before I would like to put it to full screen. Just a second. Yeah, sorry, I'm joining from uh, Brussels. It's uh, now not so early, but 
excuse me if I drop dead in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> no worries. The, the key uh, question is, have you had your morning coffee or not? <laughs> yeah, actually, you, you know, I woke up and there was no more coffee. So okay. that was my... Th my then we're safe. We're all but safe. But I went for tea, <laughs> so it's, it's also good. Um, I had just a second. I'll, I'll be with you. I have to open it with uh, PDF. View so full screen mode. Not. Okay. God, I'm really not good with them. Um, okay. Yes, we see the screen now. Uh, and full screen mode. Is that working? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Sorry. Uh, and yes, good morning to uh, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Mona uh, Deluc, and I work for Holsim. I'm a global uh, positioning uh, public manager. And uh, for those of you who don't uh, don't know Holsim, we are a global manufacturer of building ma uh, materials and solutions. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here uh, today and to address you, uh, city stakeholders, uh, because as I'm representing a big industry, uh, there's no need to uh, remind the, the paramount role that we also have to play uh, to make our city circular and, uh, and at zero. And I think that being here today just sends the right signal that none of these uh, goals can be achieved without collaboration from the full value chain. So thanks again for, for the invitation. Um, so yeah, let me dive into the core of this presentation. I'm, I'm here to introduce you to the, to the Circular Cities Barometer. It's a tool that we have developed with uh, Bloomberg over the last year. Um, for, for to start, the tool is in constant evolution. Uh, I'm presenting it to you as it is uh, today, uh, but there will be more phases of development uh, in the coming months where uh, your engagement will be key. Um, to give you a bit more uh, uh, context, um, so we are a, a manufacturer of building solutions, um, but we just want part of the chain. Uh, we produce materials um, like cement, like concrete, which are uh, the most used materials in a majority of our cities today. And we are asked as a company to uh, decarbonize our operations and also to increase the circularity of our products. But there's so much we can do if we don't go beyond our boundaries. And that's what we wanted to understand, uh, how our materials are actually being used and how cities approach them and how generally the built environment is embedded in a uh, circular transformation strategy. And honestly, this is not something we have necessarily focused on uh, in the past. And that's why we wanted to come up with a project to and, and create a tool that would zoom into the good practices, the good circular practices of know, a selection of leading cities across the world with the intent to learn how we can better contribute and provide better solutions uh, to enable you cities to uh, go faster in your circularity transformation. I don't think I need to insist any further on the important uh, role of uh, cities in fighting climate change, but I do find this quote of a uh, uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres to be very powerful because it's as alarming as it is hopeful. It's true that cities are uniquely uh, positioned to uh, help us move to net zero and to test and implement circular models. But again, this is not a uh, uh, one player thing. It's, uh, it needs and requires uh, collaboration. It requires collaboration from the full value chain. And uh, again, talking from an industry side, it, it requires innovation also from hard to abate sectors like ours. So to give you a quick overview of this tool, <coughs> um, it evaluates, sorry, <coughs> it evaluates 25 of the most circular cities uh, in the world. The, the the cities were selected uh, among almost 100 uh, cities whose mayors participate in C40. So C40 uh, operates on a on a performance uh, based requirement uh, that sets minimum standards of climate action in order to be uh, to be met in order to become a member. So that was perfect for us in the in the sense that C40 helped us as a benchmark for cities that met both. Uh, our circular focus, but also uh, 
again data availability requirements which is a which is a big topic because it's of course important that we uh, look at these cities from a, from a common uh, standpoint and the cities were all selected so that uh, all global regions are represented and to ensure that <clears throat> representative data is again available so each uh, city was scored uh, on its performance on 12 indicators uh, organized in in four categories but look at circular buildings to start with uh, here we for example um, looked at the number of certified buildings we also looked at cdb re cdp rating sorry in terms of energy efficiency and smart design but we also look at um, urban temperatures also over the years as a comparison um, if we look at systems now, here we look um, at the percentage of uh, annual re annual energy from renewable sources, for example. We look at the percentage of um, municipal solid waste that is diverted every year from uh, from landfills and, and incineration. And uh, looking at water, we look at the percentage, for example, of wastewater that is uh, safely uh, treated every year. If we look at circular living, um, here um, it's about the type of mobility sharing programs in place in the city, the percentage of land that is covered with trees and um, uh, any innovative transportation models in place. And finally, you know, another important pillar, the leadership one. First, we look at the, uh, at the Paris Agreement alignment, but also at the policies, the circular policies and roadmap, roadmaps in place, as well as any fiscal uh, incentives in place. In general, the data was collected, uh, that was collected is weighted uh, based on three important pillars, the, the impact a category or, or the indicator has on the circularity of a city, the number of cities rep reporting data for a given indicator and the number of cities participating in a given indicator. The three main objectives of this tool are, first of all, to create uh, awareness on the existing uh, circular models across the world that cities can implement. But it's also to shed light on replicable case studies uh, in order to accelerate the scale up of these uh, good practices, but eventually uh, close the gap between theory and, and practice. And finally, uh, this is going back to the value chain, is, is to create a framework for innovation in order to engage uh, all actors of the value chain to effectively uh, operate a change. So the key points of uh, this tool, um, we are presenting uh, success stories of 25 of the, it's important to mention, uh, the most circular cities in the world. It's a tool that has been created for city stakeholders along with the full value chain. So it's also addressed it's, and sh should also serve as inspiration <clears throat> for architects, urban planners and developers in, and uh, investors. And we've been taking this uh, tool uh, uh, over the all over the world with us last year. We've presented it at uh, the World Economic Forum, the London Climate Week, the New York Climate Week and COP27. And we learned along the way that there is uh, a huge um, interest uh, in this in this parameter. Um, as we will be uh, if I, if I look at the next steps now, uh, as, as we will be improving the tool, uh, adding more cities, adjusting the indicators, um, the, the, uh, so we, we, we saw, you saw that we did a, a ranking, which is, uh, which is a risky move, uh, but it also can also be, a, a actually a healthy competition, but we want to move away from this ranking and, and create more of a, of communities of, of learners and mentors, um, and also adjust more the the circularity uh, indicators and criterias 
And so this is where we will be needing uh, your input because we need to diversify our sources and we need to look into uh, more success stories uh, in order to move from the learning part in which we are now uh, into the engagement part and then uh, eventually into acting and inspire, inspiring other cities to replicate uh, uh, existing circular practices. So you have to think of um, this tool as uh, as a huge uh, visibility platform for the work you're doing uh, to achieve climate objectives, and and I'm inviting you to, again to uh, to engage with us. The door is open, and also for feedback, uh, it's a tool that we have developed uh, for you. And so, of course, we're keen on uh, on feedback and to know how it is uh, perceived. Um, that's it. Uh, that's it for me. So um, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mona. Can we give her a big hand, please? Yeah. Can you hear me still? Yes. Um, can we take any questions? Sorry, I think you're on mute. <laughs> so we have a question for you, Mona Bharat. Yes. yes. So Mona, many thanks for you know sharing this. It's a very very valuable tool. So for I was just browsing your website and seeing the ranking of Delhi actually. So here yes. I just want to you know add upon uh, two points. One is uh, Delhi has the largest construction and demolition waste recycling facility in the country. Okay, in terms of embodied energy, whenever yeah. we are you know trying to avoid any concrete or you know other metals thing, so that quantum of energy is you know very huge. So that you know really reduces the overall carbon footprint of the city. So I would request you to kindly take into consideration that because. Uh, in terms of circular building, in terms of energy efficient building or in terms of circular investment that would add a huge uh, you know impact to the overall school. Yes. And secondly for your correction Delhi has only one landfill and others are crude dump sites. So you know you really have to either you know uh, look at a proper definition or you know define the waste streams and you know then uh, create an overall impact. Yeah, and overall yes. it's a very, very good tool and I hope that it would have, you know, more wide use and uh, I would support the overall ranking because, you know, that motivates the city to move on and, you know, good. elevate uh, gradually in the overall rankings. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the input and uh, please get in touch with us. This is exactly why uh, it's important to bring the tool out there. Uh, so you notice there is an overall ranking indeed, but then if you look, look into uh, precisely circular buildings, you'll see that the ranking reshuffles and that Delhi actually uh, comes back up. Uh, so you, there's, there's many levels to this ranking, uh, but very super insightful uh, comment. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we have a question from back there. Oh, thank you. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, regarding the scoring of 25 cities uh, that you collected and shared uh, uh, just now on city Seattle, I think it is in Washington, it's a port city. Is there any initiative from the policy level to push uh, to get this 100% uh, score? Uh, I mean 100%, okay. And one thing, the second thing is, is there any, I think it's a Delhi is there or any other uh, city in this uh, ranking out of these 25 cities that you have selected? Especially, specifically, what is the initiative taken by the Seattle city to have this 100 percentage score? So on, on the first question regarding the policy, uh, this is, uh, of course, this is a very important pillar. I think in the, in the future, we want to maybe put more weight on the leadership uh, pillar because that's, of course, uh, the first incentivize, incentivize, incentivize uh, to, 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 to implement a circular model. So, and this very, very much de de depends on the region. Uh, our, our policy and regulatory framework in Europe, for example, is, is much different from the one that we have uh, in the US or elsewhere in the world. So this is very uh, um, dependent and on, on, the, on the Seattle uh, example. Of course, uh, Seattle has been um, a, a leading example in this ranking. Uh, the the systems and the buildings in place, I mean, Seattle, uh, the, the vision we have of it is that 
city, the city is really thought as a system, uh, and and the the buildings are not are not thought in silos. Uh, it's everything. All the systems are very well interconnected, and and you can see this in the in the and it, it transparency uh, a lot in the living and on the feedback the people in Seattle uh, also uh, giving on the way the city is organized uh, to be a, to be a very livable place. Um, but there's there's a this is also where the, the limits of this because a hundred percent score is of course you would think oh the city is perfect. Um, it is. It is very good, but it's not. It's not a. There's always room for improvement. None of these cities are are like the best in the world. Uh, again, it has to be based on a on a. Uh, it's one data. It's, it comes from C40. We had to make sure that we had available data for all the cities we wanted to represent. But we are looking into uh, diversifying the sources, uh, connecting with other city networks. Uh, to have a, a much more broad overview of cities ex and not just us uh, staying to uh, 25 cities in the end. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, more questions? Yeah, Holger, please. Yeah. Hi, thanks. thanks a lot, very inspiring. Uh, just a question. Myself, I work for the uh, German International Cooperation Agency, GIZ, but I put myself into a city's, let's say, mind. To engage you within my city, what would it cost? What, would, what should I do to be, let's say, somehow subject of, of your engagement? Just a phone call. <laughs> no. Wow. Yeah, no, it's not much more than this. Honestly, uh, we are. We've been very shy, actually, uh, uh, knocking at city's door. Uh, we, we, as I said, we we've been taking this tool uh, at global events, and it's had a really good uh, reception. Uh, but but it, this is exactly what we want to do. We we want cities to feel inspired and motivated to be in this ranking, to be in this on this platform. So there's really not much more that you need to do than to uh, send an email, and and we have a we have a discussion on on. Uh, uh, it's a bit like uh, it motivates us, <laughs> and and uh, and we will be uh, we will be reshuffling the the whole. Um, the, the whole tool within the coming months. So if there's a moment where you want to tell good stories about, about the cities you're representing, uh, you, it's, it's the moment, really. And, uh, and that either means, we that add... Means there's no need, let's say, to calculate for 2025 x thousand of rupees in my budget no, to no, pay no, no, your no. service. No, 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 nothing. It's, it's a free tool. <laughs> okay. It's a free tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, it's it's supposed to be inspiring. There's a there's a there's no uh, business plan behind this uh, at all. It's uh, it's just supposed to be a great motivational tool to uh, again. And if if the ranking for you is a is a good thing, then uh, again, let, that's a very good feedback because I've been I've been pushing to stop doing this, but uh, maybe I'm, I was wrong. And actually, it is a healthy competition that should be uh, carried on. So. Yes, super, super insights. Um, but uh, my contacts will be shared, and I believe there's a, uh, a link also to the barometer directly, but um, please get in touch with me. Yes, for sure. Uh, yeah, Just I think one uh, more the related question. I'm Gitika Goswami. I work for Development Alternatives. It's a think tank in DA, a think tank in Delhi. Uh, so my question is, uh, we are also working with many cities on the waste management and circularity and building materials especially. Uh, my question is, uh, th this is really great that you are doing it uh, voluntarily, but I think the data that has to be provided by the cities, right? Yeah. And uh, that tools, you, will can, you can then do, uh, uh, do it through the tool and then uh, give them the ranking, right? Yes, yes indeed. Yeah. And do also, I, I think I missed that, uh, also you do the carbon uh, part of it, the carbon emission uh, reduction. Uh, um, not so quite. Not, no, no, no. But here it was really looking at circular flows uh, and, and circular, which is actually not uh, precisely what this needs to be refined. But, but the carbon, I mean, we look at it uh, from, 
from a building perspective, we look at it from a transportation perspective, but not as, as an overall. Okay, thank you. Which is uh, also, again, another good feedback, uh, sh should probably be included. Yeah. Hi, uh, Muna. My name is Aarti. I'm from Sahas. So uh, to me, this looks like uh, something like an ESG of sorts uh, for yeah. cities. Am I right? I yeah. mean, do you, you have a tool and where you kind of provide, the cities have to provide, fill in the form and give their information. So what I want to understand is at the time where circular systems are still in the process of being defined, and obviously there will be a lot of fine tuning in your processes as well. Uh, yeah. and, and, and to my surprise, uh, the, the 25 cities you have chosen, they have a very different geographic and demographic profile. There is mm -hmm. Delhi, there is New York, there is Wuhan as well, uh, yeah. you know. So, so it, it is really surprising how you have kind of categorized or clubbed everything, ev all these different kind of cities under one broad umbrella. So yeah. do, you, do you plan to diversify and make uh, it into something like a population based or say a geography based or you know some some other uh, criteria just like esg has now evolved into different industry specific uh, uh, you know parameters yeah that that's the the c40 was was uh, a super benchmark but was also uh, the limiting uh, aspect of it uh, by 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 basing uh, all of this um, all, uh, this this ranking and study on one source which was C40 members, we were of course limited in, in the number of cities we could, we could show because we wanted to again have, uh, uh, be able to, to compare and to look at these cities from a common standpoint. We are of course looking into, uh, by adding more cities, we will be able to specify regions. We still want to have an overall uh, vision of, of cities across the world, that's something we want to keep. But by engaging cities and by adding more cities, we will be able to define regions with their uh, own specificities. And, and this, is, this will be eventually the thing we want to, we will, where we want to lead. Uh, but that will only be possible if we have more input and if we have available data for everything. We have, we have very good connections with the Resilient Cities Network. Uh, and, and this will be bringing another um, source of data from, from uh, the the the, the uh, another another part of the world that is not less really well represented with Asia, uh, and and this we're counting a lot to develop this region. Indeed, there's a lot of focus on Europe for the moment, a lot of focus on on the US. Uh, but as soon as we have more cities, we will be able able to have uh, more weight in each region and and specify a lot more because indeed systems are not the same and and they are as you say, in development uh, everywhere. So, yeah. Yeah, Constantinos. Hi, Mona. Uh, I'm Constantinos from Really Prospect. Uh, yeah. We, uh, in our organization, we're doing a similar service. We provide a similar service for cities and uh, private businesses related to the estimation of, of their greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. the, this, this particular exercise is based on standardized protocols. For example, the ISO 14064 or the uh, GHC protocol of the World Resource Institute. And my question yeah. would be, is this your approach validated somehow from a, a standard or a, yeah, a, a, an external organization or a, mm. an auditor or something? Yeah. Thanks. Um, yes, that's a that's a very valid question. Um, so, so the, the the deep dive work was conducted with with Bloomberg, uh, who's a very uh, a long term partner of C40, and they have they have uh, engaged on these uh, on these indicators together. Whether it's validated, uh, this I will have to double check, but. Um, by an external party besides C40 and besides Bloomberg, I'm I'm not so sure actually. Um, so, but very valid point because that will bring more weight and legitimacy to uh, to uh, to the thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That would be really, really, uh, really helpful yeah. also for you since you're trying to do it to several cities. That would be a great. Of really course, great. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it yeah, will help point. others. You, maybe you can help them. You know, create a standard 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, but one common standard that's going to be a tough one. If we look at if we look at region again, that will be uh, it will be easier indeed. Thank yes. you. Any last questions? Yeah, there's one here. Hi, Mona. Hello. My name is Kotesh Rao from Hyderabad, South India. Uh, in, our in your slide, uh, I remember carbonizing the building from foundation to roofing. Yes. Uh, how to understand? About yeah. uh, how to understand? Uh, is it like uh, using recycled material in the building or uh, designing the building in a energy efficient way? Are you talking uh, about uh, solutions that 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 wholesome or uh, are you talking about wholesome uh, solutions? No, no, in the first slide, in your flash, first slide, yeah. carbonize the building from foundation to roofing. One sentence ah. I remember. Ah, so, so, yeah, yeah, uh, when, when we say that. Uh, in the first slide, one paragraph is there. Yeah, the, the, the wholesome brands offer solutions ah. to decarbonize buildings. Yeah. From foundations to rooftop. That, uh, how I should understand, like, uh, is it like uh, using recyclable material in the building or uh, design that so building in a uh, energy efficient way? So we have we have different types of solutions. Uh, we, as I said, we, we produce uh, concrete and cement that we uh, are doing both low carbon and circular. And when we talk about our circular uh, solutions, they are made of... Uh, construction and demolition waste. So part of, part of our cement are produced with recycled materials. And when we say that we go from foundation, so that we're talking basically about foundation materials such as yeah, indeed cement and concrete, and then we go all the way to the rooftop because we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, rooftop solutions and also insulation for, for, uh, solutions. So we, we are now proposing a very wide range of uh, solutions to um, to, for the new build, for new buildings, but also a lot of solutions for renovation work and to tackle um, energy efficiency of buildings, retrofitting of buildings um, from from the building, from the materials you use as as a foundation to to the to the rooftops um, and green roof solutions that we also uh, offer, which are also themselves um, produced from from recycled materials. Okay, okay, I got it now. Because I thought that uh, using recycled material in the roofing also, because uh, recycled material will not be used in the structural elements. It, uh, well, we try, we tend to do this now. Uh, that's, that's the idea. Uh, that's, it, that's also why um, the cement industry is also um, an actor of the circular economy, because we, we have a material that we can infinitely uh, uh, recycle and reuse. And that requires uh, a lot of incentives. Uh, I'm, I'm talking uh, regulatory framework to be al to allow us to do more. We're doing already a bit. Um, we have brands, uh, cement brands, that already include up to 35% of uh, s uh, construction demolition waste. But for the moment, we are only. Uh, able to do so in uh, Switzerland, for example, to give you an example, because the norms and the standards uh, allow us to do so. Uh, we will look into launching a, a, a global brand, a circular global brand this year, uh, but that also depends on, on uh, regulatory uh, developments. Um, but this is what we tend to do, and, and the, the, the best is to be circular and low carbon, which is... Uh, this is another step in, in, in the, the improvement of our products. But uh, that's definitely where we want to go. Eventually, we want to reduce uh, the clinker factor of our, of our products, which is the most intensive, CO2 intensive parts of the cement production, and to replace it completely with uh, uh, construction and demolition waste material. But that's, that's, it requires, I mean, if we look into materials, it, it requires infrastructures. It requires sorting infrastructures. It requires a lot of... Uh, 
there's there's a whole value chain uh, uh, around this to to make this a reality tomorrow. But but it is it is a possibility. Is it yet a reality? No. Uh, but it is a possibility for sure. Okay, thanks. Sir. How to yeah. apply for ranking from my city? Sorry. How to apply for ranking for my you, city? You can get in touch with me. And okay. uh, as we will be diverse uh, again, we will be reshuffling the Because uh, Hyderabad is doing good at uh, solid waste management and uh, construction and demolition. And recently we got award of uh, world class, world tree city. Yeah. And also most livable city. Yeah. So we try to communicate this to my higher ups. Please remember my city name is Hyderabad. <laughs> okay. okay. I will remember that. <laughs> Good marketing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think at this moment we have to close questions. I will share um, not only just Mo Mona's but all the speakers' information in a while. You'll be able to reach out to them. And uh, yeah, I, I would expect the con conversation to be more one on one. Then you can reach out and speak to her. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you for taking You're this welcome. early morning and sharing your information with us. Thank you. Very happy to be here. I'll, I'll still, I'll stay connected, huh? Yeah, yeah. Feel free. Yeah, cool. <laughs> we'll go on to the next uh, talk soon. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Then on that note, um, I'd like to move over uh, to our next speaker, uh, Shruti Sadhu Khan from Ikle. We set up. Start. Right. It is still not showing, but I will move on. My name is Beda Shruti. I'm from Ikle, South Asia. And uh, Ikle is uh, basically an association of local governments. We work with municipalities, with cities uh, all over the world. We have, uh, it's a global organization. We have like 27 offices all over the world. Uh, my office is uh, the South Asian office. Uh, we are based in Delhi. We have uh, offices all over India. We have smaller offices in Bangladesh and Nepal also. Uh, we work in the South Asian region because we are based in Delhi, uh, Delhi we are, because we are based in India, obviously, we work more in India. Uh, okay, great. And I've covered this slide. <laughs> the way we have been working is through these uh, five pathways. Uh, this is uh, basically a low emission development pathway, nature based pathway, equitable, people centered development, resilient development and circular development. Considering the fact that cities work on different issues, that uh, municipalities are involved with, uh, um, with different um, aspects of development, we feel that having these kind of uh, holistic approach would help the city become more sustainable, which is our basic agenda. And the circular development pathway is uh, one of these pathways. Uh, we have introduced these pathways in, uh, in our uh, World Congress in Montreal in 2018, and we have been continuing with this. So the reason why we started working on circularity is because uh, cities are really uh, drivers of the linear economy. We have this uh, usual process of uh, taking, making, and then wasting, and this linear economy is continuing, which is what uh, Apurva was also mentioning, that the, uh, you know, the circularity index is going down. Uh, I think that is also... Uh, I mean, it's quite evident from the way our cities functions. Uh, cities consume like 75% of the world's natural resources. They are actually uh, covering only 2% of the land, the global land masses, only 2% is cities, but it does consume a lot of resources, They're responsible for 70% uh, of the emissions. I think it's a little higher now. Uh, cities produce 50% of the global waste that is uh, produced. 
and that's why it is extremely important to work on circular concepts for cities. I would be talking about a framework that we have come up with um, and that is the framework that we encourage cities to follow. All parts of the framework may or may not be applicable to all cities, but we try to uh, inculcate a, a, a holistic approach to their uh, working on, uh, on circularity. I'm sorry, there's some fly which is constantly disturbing me. Uh, yeah, so the benefits that we see from having a circular uh, development uh, agenda is that there is obviously reduced GHG emissions because there's a lot of uh, uh, production that is reduced. There is lower waste management costs. Uh, there is economic development and job creation. There is reduced congestion, air pollution, and there are more connected communities. But while we are starting to work on uh, circularity, we do realize that there are a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers that the cities face. Uh, in implementing the circular economy. So the, the one thing is that there is a lack of awareness, there is a lack of political buy-in. Uh, city leaders in this part of the world do not really uh, always have a clear vision of city development. It is very few cities which actually have a city vision. Uh, not all cities even have a city vision. Uh, and given that, uh, so there is ad hoc development. There is something which, I mean, funding comes in in some uh, aspect, so there is work on that aspect. Suddenly moves to another aspect, uh, priorities change. So this kind of thing happens, and there is a lack of political buy-in for circular concepts. There is a lack of political buy-in for all kinds of, uh, you know, sustainability concepts, which is more abstract, which is not something that you can see on the ground. It is something that you live through. Uh, then uh, there is also a problem of knowing where to start. I mean, uh, even if you are interested, it is uh, challenging for the cities to understand where do they start? Where will the circular economy begin? How do they start working on it? Uh, there is also the problem of internal silos. I think all of us working in cities, we, we understand that you work with one department and the other departments don't even know who you are. So there is a problem of these uh, siloed um, uh, work work processes that the city follows. And uh, finally, from strategizing to implementing, how do the cities move in? How do they uh, provide finance to actually implement work? How do they move their budgets around? Or how do they actually implement what they have planned for uh, in, uh, in any aspect, in a, particularly for circular development? How do they actually implement these actions? That is something which, is, which remains a challenge. So uh, this is something that we want to address through these, uh, through this circular city actions framework, the CCAF that we call. Uh, the framework was developed in um, collaboration with Circle Economy, with Metabolic and Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, it has actually five strategies. So I don't know whether it is visible or not over there. It has five strategies of rethinking, uh, regenerating, reusing, reduce, and recover. So these five uh, uh, strategy that we have, we feel that through these approaches, uh, a holistic uh, circular economy can be, um, uh, can be implemented. So the way we are uh, doing this is that uh, in each of these phases, so before you actually take uh, resources and before you actually uh, start extraction, uh, what you need to do is you need to rethink, you need to regenerate. When we are talking about rethink, it means redesigning systems to lay the foundation for circular activities to enable the transition for, uh, towards a circular economy. Regenerate means how do you harmonize with nature? It, it involves your nature-based uh, solutions. It involves your um, ecosystem-based approaches so that um, you have a holistic and circular uh, development. You, you, you do the link between, you know, you close the loop of your material flow. Uh, 
next is after you uh, after you have taken your resources before you even make it you try to reduce you try to reuse reducing means uh, you do more and better with less resources whereas in case of reuse you use the goods for a longer time and for more times and finally before you go to the waste part you recover as much as possible you recover uh, now I have only one minute left and I have uh, several slides which I wanted to cover but I will what I will do is that I will quickly uh, let you know that there are uh, several examples I have and uh, I, I will not go into the details of uh, each of these examples but um, there is, there is something uh, like the redesigning of the systems, the rethinking part is uh, clearly shown. So I can actually share this, uh, these slides with you people and you can look into the um, links. This will be uh, useful for you also to understand how it uh, starts from you know, a complete overhaul of the system like uh, in this case the Hammerby district in Sweden. They have completely uh, changed the way they're working. Uh, they've included wastewater management with their district heating systems and district cooling systems. They've included uh, waste management with their transportation. So all of that is, uh, it's a complete rehaul of the entire designing system. Whereas there are also uh, examples of, uh, for example, in Brasilia, which is looking at regenerating their uh, uh, natural resources so that there is more uh, water resources. They were facing a crisis on water supply and they, that is how they have regenerated their water resources. Uh, we have a local example from Jaipur as well, which is looking at uh, uh, a textile park, a textile industry park, uh, which, which has facilities for water recycling, rainwater harvesting, energy conservation, so how all of that got incorporated. Um, we uh, have... Can I interrupt? Uh, could, you, could you go back to the Jaipur uh, slide? Yes. Uh, can you perhaps give us a quick idea of what was the starting and the... It, it was a, it was a EU funded project and uh, it was a, it's, it's not actually by the city. Uh, <clears throat> this was a private funded project uh -huh. and it was implemented by in this part. Okay. Um, I can, I mean, you can go into the uh, link and see the details of it. Okay. They've come up with a toolkit which can be used in these, uh, uh, this type of industrial parks okay. to move towards circular development. So it's okay. a Switch Asia project, uh, how Perfect. to move towards Thank you so much. Uh, this thing. Uh, we have in Seoul who has moved towards car sharing and bike sharing uh, mechanisms which is helping them to reuse the cars for longer and it has actually reduced their uh, uh, ownership of cars and also reduced carbon emissions. Then uh, in case of uh, waste, I think waste actually is quite a good example. We have several cities in India which is working on waste uh, uh, recovery and uh, on also on waste, um, you know, recycling, uh, all of that is uh, there in India uh, also. This is an example from Ghana. Uh, here it is not just solid waste, it is also sewage and uh, both food waste and sewage waste, so organic waste. And this is composted and they have been using it as fertilizers and for generating electricity. I think a lot of this is also uh, uh, can be seen in India. Uh, there are several cities which are moving towards biomethanation uh, using uh, organic waste to produce biogas. And then uh, I, I know in Indore they are using it as biofuels also. Some of the other cities that we are working with, they are also uh, wanting to do the same. So yeah, this is uh, something which we have been doing. Uh, Turku in Finland has actually implemented this entire roadmap. They've been supporting us into uh, fine tuning the roadmap also uh, using the circular city actions framework. And they have been looking at these five thematic areas. And uh, I would suggest that if cities also want to look at um, uh, circularity in their uh, development plans, then they should also prioritize which areas they should be, they want to look at because they will not be able to cover all areas at one go. But uh, having said that, it is also important to have this concept of holistic approach. So you, you would need to look at different aspects so that you can plan better. And then maybe when it comes to implementation, then you take up parts of the plan and start implementing. <coughs> I don't want to go into this, I've already covered this and so yeah, if it sounds like uh, something we can help out with, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. 
this is uh, one of the email IDs, but I can also share my own email ID, and you can reach out to me uh, personally. And before you start with uh, how will how much it will cost, it will <laughs> it will basically so the first question is already <laughs> predicted. <laughs> It will uh, cost um, not much, so the tool is free, of course. Uh, our services, however, have, I mean, we have to give time to it, so uh, definitely we would expect that the city should cover uh, at least some of the staff cost. If not, that is also manageable, but then in that case, the city would have to have the commitment that, you know, you want to move towards circularity and then the city will have to give some of their time because then uh, collecting data or putting it into the, uh, into the tool, uh, making the plans, it needs involvement of the city officials, it needs involvement of other stakeholders preferably also. So uh, I, I don't think it will be a very costly affair for a city. I'm pretty sure uh, all cities have these mechanisms of uh, having meetings, regular meetings and so on, so they can just put it as part of their agenda. Uh, our costs are uh, usually nominal and uh, we generally do not charge from the cities. What we do is we try to find sources of funding which is external and then we uh, put in that fund for our staff costs. So. Okay, so that was the first question answered. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have the second, <laughs> please? Yeah, thank you and uh, good, nice presentation. And surely I want the presentation so that <laughs> we can go back to the link. Uh, I have two uh, things in my mind. If you are looking at the all the nine, uh, you know, strategies of the circularity, uh, except recycling, you are using all these, but remanufacture and repurpose, these two are not uh, That's kind in the of rethink part, where uh, you're redesigning the whole uh, redesigning, thing. Redesigning, repurpose yes. so and remanufacture. This, yeah. Yes. So this, uh, you know, this framework is ideally for a city, uh, for a local government to implement. So they don't really manufacture stuff. So this is more uh, addressed towards that. But what you are talking about looks into more of a, uh, like, companies, industries can look into that also. And uh, if you want to implement them, then that will come under the redesign, the rethink part of it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a comment basically because you know, since morning we have been seen, you know, seeing through three wonderful tools, but every tool has, you know, some plus and minus. So I would, you know, suggest that if you all three can work together, <laughs> coming out from the silos, <laughs> and then, you know, we are able to make a, you know, we, can, we are able to compensate for the shortfalls. Like the whole SIM tool had some shortfalls, you are working in India, you are, you know, more uh, aware of the local factors. So if you three are working together, hosted by a common agency or a common platform, that would really, you know, focus the efforts and we can, you know, come out with a globally acceptable tool in a much shorter time. That's no, it. I, I completely agree. I mean, jokes apart, this is not really funny because I was also thinking the same thing uh, because uh, when I was uh, looking at the tools that were being presented in the morning, I realized that, so our, uh, this thing is, it's not really a tool, it's a framework, it's a process of thinking, it's how you plan. Whereas in case of theirs, uh, it has a lot of measurement components. It has a lot of, uh, you know, numbers and data that they will require to actually implement the tool. And I think they are quite complementary. Uh, I would assume that the uh, type of information that they would be collecting would actually form the baseline for uh, the overall plan that could be designed on in terms of these uh, five um, uh, rethink, regenerate, reduce, reuse things. Yeah. So I, I, I would admit UNEP is guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are the ones that are actually working with all of the people that are working on these tools. And that is exactly what we are trying to do. We're trying to bring together, um, because it, it, it's not just these agencies, actually. There's yes. plenty of people out there working on tools towards circularity. And what UNEP is trying to do is trying to make sense of what is useful, what's best for cities. And it's fora like this that help us to better understand 
what would be useful for cities around the world. So this feedback is very, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. And just to compliment, I'm Alexander from Living Prospects, but I also have another hat. I'm working with the Switch to Green facility. It's a European Commission facility supporting uh, the circular economy. And I would just like to compliment what was said, that we, the European Union supports UNEP financially and, and the other um, organizations. And I was glad to see that uh, a Switch Asia project, for example, has helped your uh, work there. It would be great if we could see it in the slides as well, that uh, <laughs> there is this funding. Um, and I think that the, um, all the uh, people that are working on this, um, uh, these initiatives have understood the importance of coherence, of coordination, and we are working on that direction together. Hopefully, uh, we will be able to produce uh, new initiatives that will be more cohesive, let's say, in, uh, in their deliverables. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this is the comment. Hi, I'm uh, Zigisha Maskar from Pune Kushagra. Um, I had a question that, similar to the other tools, this tool also you have must have tried at some places. So what are the common challenges that you see that come up for cities to implement it? Action planning is one, but when you go towards the implementation, what are the kind of challenges that you commonly come up? So um, the tool has been implemented, I think, in uh, Turku in Finland only. Uh, Parts of it are being um, implemented by our different projects. So we are an NGO, so we work with funds <laughs> or wherever funds are available. We try to incorporate different components in these projects. So parts of it are being implemented in uh, different areas in, uh, say, solid waste management, in water uh, management, and so on. Um, I think the primary challenge in case of implementation is um, so. There is, an, uh, there is a challenge of finance, but I don't want to go into that. The primary challenge in implementation is actually when you need a circular approach, you need to talk to different agencies and work together. So the primary challenge is that. Getting different government departments at the same table, it's, it's challenging. It's, a, it's difficult. I think <laughs> Yasser knows better than me. And yeah, that is, that is, I think, the most important challenge. So once we get that in place, I think uh, ma money can be managed from different sources, but the uh, the systems place is very important. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, sorry, India. Can I just um, ask the city officials to comment? Uh, do you see uh, what? How do you connect uh, with this framework? Is there something that you see that's interesting from your perspective? Any cities? We are already uh, working with Kikri, so uh, we are already having a partnership. Uh, for the five, uh, among the framework, uh, we are having five elements, food, construction, mobility, solid waste, and water recycling. So we can say that uh, as far as the solid waste and water recycling is concerned, yeah. We have to anyway work uh, due to the sweat survection and many of the cities are working <coughs> on that part. On mobility part also we are working because uh, just uh, uh, three years ago we started to induct uh, uh, e uh, battery buses, uh, battery operated buses in the BRTS and now the fleet has increased uh, to 200. Uh, as of now we are having uh, challenges of implementing this uh, circular city concept in food and construction. Uh, in the construction also the private builders are coming up with the more, gre uh, more green buildings and uh, uh, so far but uh, the initiatives are surely lacking mm. uh, as far as the construction and food is concerned. I would like to have a few uh, more input from your side ma'am uh, regarding uh, uh, how to implement this circular concept in food. Uh, I am not uh, able to visualize more about the food. So if you can okay. please uh, highlight something about the food uh, it sure. would be helpful. So uh, the way we uh, understand is that if uh, for city, uh, cities don't really uh, work on agriculture, they, they don't really have um, agricultural fields uh, within the city, but there are peri-urban areas which often feed the city. So there are, um, there is agriculture, there is uh, horticulture going on uh, around the city, which feeds into the city because the market is within the city. 
the way circularity will work is if you can start working with those areas uh, which is actually coming to your local markets so the food which is coming to your local markets if you can have your waste the organic waste that you are generating uh, if you can generate uh, fertilizers and then have an exchange with those areas as well so that's how it feeds into the food systems okay thank you uh, I would really suggest you to connect uh, directly with Shruti. Um, we'd like to move on to the next two speakers so that you can also get a break before we uh, come together for the closing session. So thank you so much, Shruti. It was thank a you. wonderful presentation. <laughs> Let's give her a big hand. Thank you very much. And can we have Sharon from UNEP on stage next? Not reading this. Just a second. Let's check if it's showing us something else. We can use the one that's saved. It's fine. Can I use that? Yeah. Okay. Let's just use the one that was saved. Okay. And it's it's. No, it's uh, my presentation is with you. Yeah. Uh, I saved it as well. Here. Yeah, yeah, it's here, but we're not able to open it. Just give me a second. I'll start while we're waiting for the presentation, just to save on time. I know um, it would help for everyone to have a longer lunch time. So <laughs> put everybody in a good mood, right? So um, uh, let me just start with a short introduction on the UN Environment Program. My name is Sharon Hill. I lead uh, UNEP's work on cities. Um, uh, so. For those of you who are not familiar with UNEP, we are, a UN a we are the UN agency that's uh, responsible for setting the global environmental agenda. What that means in practice, it sounds very, very lofty, but what that means in practice is that um, our main work vis-a-vis -vis other UN agencies is that we set up and host these global conventions. Um, our greatest hits include the Montreal yeah. Protocol, saving the <laughs> ozone layer. This one? Uh, it's the updated one. This, this one? This. 
and the Stockholm Convention, for example, on persistent organic pollutants. Um, we also helped set up the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and we host the Convention on Biological Diversity. So, excuse me. Thank you. Another part of the, the thing that we do as UNEP is to ensure that these global environmental agreements are implemented, of course. And part of that would be to integrate the language and the actions embedded in these agreements into projects that would support national governments in the implementation and also agencies, different agencies, uh, nonprofits, think tanks, um, uh, technical agencies, in, uh, so that they are able to implement this global environmental agreements and that it all adds up to significant impact. And that's why, as I admitted earlier, um, it's our fault <laughs> that a lot of the tools are, we, we do want to work with, with everybody. So our um, Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction works with Holsim, for example. Um, we work very closely with, we, this tool that I'm presenting to you was uh, co-developed with Circle Economy. And we provided input as well to the city scan tool that was developed with, by, with Metabolic. Um, uh, Shruti and I have worked together as well in, in a few other projects. So it's really an ecosystem. We work within an ecosystem and try to influence the direction of the ecosystem towards the multilateral environmental agreements. When, um, when the presentation was made, uh, my, um, going back to yesterday, one, one key insight that I had um, during the discussions was that I feel that as UNEP, we have not communicated well enough the urgency of the situation. And I think that this graphic really shows this. Um, and this graphic is from Circle Economy, which uh, my colleague Apurva uh, showed earlier. Half a trillion tons of virgin materials and only about 7% is circular. Now that's, that's huge, considering that many of these, these resources are finite, and these are essential for our survival, shelter, food, water. Um, and if we are not able to make these resources circular, um, well, it would threaten human survival. The world would probably continue, but without humanity. And the reality is we don't have 50 years to do this. There's a race. Um, if you uh, look up tipping points, um, um, Professor Rockstrom uh, of the Stockholm Environment Institute would show you exactly how, um, how urgent the need is. There are presentations around how uh, Nine out of the 15 systems, planetary systems, that are keeping the world livable are under threat. So when you hear that, you understand the gravity of the situation. Now, I've been told not to be pessimistic by our comms people <laughs> because every time we, we give this news, we have to give people solutions because it's important to also note that while the challenge is huge, we human beings are innovative, are amazing. We have managed to change big systems in a way when we need to. We've toppled colonialization. We've changed, uh, we've changed our economic system from slavery. This is the scale of change that is needed. And I think that is something that we need to keep in our minds. The speed 
and the gravity and the scale of the change, is, it, it, it needs to be big. And we need everyone. And India is especially one of the biggest countries in the world, one of the uh, world leaders that needs to lead in this change. So we started looking at circular economy and how to scale it. So we started by doing material flow analysis, which I personally believe is still the best way to look at circularity in cities. But what we found that in data scarce environments, it's just really, really difficult and quite slow. Even with the most, uh, we, we worked with Brussels, we worked with uh, Recife in Brazil, we worked with, um, uh, we worked with a small city in the Philippines, we worked with Cape Town to try and see like, how can we take this MFA to scale? It, it was hard. Uh, just, just to give you an idea. So we needed to get cities interested in circularity fast. And so we were looking at a way, how do we get politicians interested in circularity? And what we found that the most interesting thing for politicians and for uh, what moved the lever within cities was to talk about circularity in the context of jobs. And that meant um, looking at not just the resource flows, but looking at the city as a whole. What, are, what makes the economy of this city tick? So look, and, and second, by looking at jobs, we were able to focus on people. Because the, when, when we started, and, I, and I'm, UNEP, uh, we're, we've been accused of liking trees more than people in several <laughs> occasions. <laughs> but um, so we started looking at how do we uh, put people in the center of the analysis. And by looking at jobs, we were able to do this. So we developed a simple tool to estimate the total number of local jobs that could be classified as circular. So um, it essentially Sorry, um, to, this was done, of course, together with Circle Economy. We classified the jobs by their economic activity using global and national databases. So the answer to the data question, you don't need to get data from the ground, but it's also not the best number. That's why I'm saying that the material flow analysis is still the best way to do it, but we use global databases, approximate the socioeconomic um, framework, the population, you know, the we've downscaled it um, using uh, input output tables we've downscaled it to each person using the population profiles and use city level um, labor force surveys to come up with this number so at the end of the day the tool shows the performance of the city based on eight key circular elements that were that were uh, co-developed with uh, Circle Economy, and cities can identify their deficits, where they are not circular enough and where they can be more circular, and how they can create more circularity within their cities by shifting their, um, their economy, economy towards more renewables, for example, towards imp and there, and you can also see through this tool where you are actually getting most of your money. So, for example, in Cochabamba, we were able to see that um, the, the money flows from the mining sector. And how do you turn that more circular? So it, it helps identify where, where the economy uh, is, uh, the, the economic profile of the city. So right now, we have data from over 300 cities around the world. And the next step, uh, this isn't really, this is a tool that can be used by cities, but the development and the work of this tool would rely on agencies like NIUA <laughs> that work with cities, and they are the ones that will work with us in getting the data. For India, for example, we don't have enough data on India, and then we will populate it. And then the next step would be working with, uh, with um, organizations like ICLE, Circle Economy, Wholesome uh, towards capacity building. 
in the appropriate industries and jobs that would move the lever towards a more circular economy. So there is a potential for the creation of new local jobs, you know, uh, making more circular supply chains. Cities need to understand that the economic transition needs to happen. This is a really rough estimate, and we would strongly encourage, it's a rough estimate, but it's a robust number, because we've already tried with several cities around the world, and we tested it. Um, to give you an example, Mexico City, we found out, was largely agricultural, and we thought we made a mistake. We talked to, uh, uh, we said, oh, this tool doesn't work. We talked to Mexico City, and they said, oh, yes, we are very agricultural. Like, oh, okay. And then that's how we, we, we pilot tested and we, we made sure that the tool works. Uh, we're also embracing circular economy as a guiding mechanism for development. And that's really what this tool um, strives to do. So I end uh, my presentation here. There's a, there's a link to the tool if you want to play with it. And um, I'll stop here for questions. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, yes, can we have one or two questions? Yeah, there you go, up front. This is uh, very interesting, you know, because uh, circular jobs will certainly be a very big motivation uh, at city level and e even at a country level. To put that number out and, uh, you know, get people interested in it will be, you know, I'm sure will be generating a lot of excitement. The other aspect that we felt could be included in, uh, you know, creating interest in circularity is uh, impact, uh, assessing the impact of the externalities. Yes. You know, so there is health, there is an environment. We mm. tell these uh, words, but, you know, obviously they are taken very vaguely. You know, there are no numbers, there is no impact, uh, you know, associated with these aspects. Mm -hmm. And we know circularity will impact you know, these numbers as well. So if the tool can also give numbers on how much city will save on the health cost, how much uh, a city will save in terms of, you know, uh, waste being managed better, hence you have better land available, you have less water contamination, hence the health impact. So these factors can, if they can be monetized in a rough manner also, but as you said, rough but mm. robust, yeah. uh, can be very useful for cities to, you know, then see, you know, I'm going to save this in 10 years in my health expenditure. Mm. So why not invest in it today? So that that's, could be That's a really good very suggestion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe, f again, comments from the city officials? Any cities would like to connect with the jobs aspect? Yes? Can we get a mic there, please, behind? Yeah. See, in India, uh, this uh, migration is happening to cities, either push or pull, for uh, employment. If we can provide this local employment in tier three cities or in uh, rural panchayats, this kind of migration can be cut. In. So, what is the modus operandi that we have uh, this local kind of employment mm -hmm. in tier three cities or in tier two cities or in the rural area mm -hmm. uh, by this mechanism? Uh, excuse me, just to clarify. So, you mean more like a territorial approach where you have the the main urban hub and a few um, rural areas, is that? Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Anyone else along the same lines? Yeah, Sadat, please. Hi, Sharon, thank you. I think very interesting, the focus on circular jobs. Yeah. I think for me, a question is, um, <laughs> when you look at the Global South, there's a lot of jobs that are actually misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So take my, my sector, nobody really knows what a scrap shop is and the impact that that job or that business is having to the city. So in these kind of frameworks, when you don't acknowledge actually the different roles and of people, the stakeholders, the types of jobs that exist, how do these frameworks account for that you know, difference in actually what's happening on the ground in terms of actual stakeholders and actual mm. jobs that currently exist versus what, you know, from a top-down perspective is expected to exist. And how does that, how do these kind of tools rectify that? Thank you. I think the reform, so to, to, a, to simplify the data gathering process, we've had to rely on national data and um, ILO data. So we're working on this with ILO, with colleagues in ILO as well. 
And the idea, in order to acknowledge the nuances in, in country and in cities, I think that a more, we need to reform these frameworks. And that's why we are working with ILO and with the national governments, because otherwise uh, change cannot happen. So for example, we have uh, an algorithm that will calculate informality in, in each of the, um, in each of the, in this tool as well. But not all countries count infor informality the same way, uh, informal jobs. So it has to be a case, for, case to case basis, unfortunately, and the reform has to, has, has to really happen at the national level. But yes, we, 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 we do acknowledge that that exists. So exciting stuff. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's been a pleasure. Um, let's close this talk. Yeah. Thank you. And as our last uh, speaker for the day, can I invite George Osborne from the city of Hume? It would be wonderful to hear how circular tools are being applied practically in this city. Over to you. Uh, yes, I think I've got um, um, through. Didn't get the signs. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Um, namaste. Hello. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm the last thing between a, a break. <laughs> so I can already feel it, you know, talk quickly. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm very conscious of time and uh, so I will keep this relatively brief. Uh, and I have some handouts and presentations which I can share which can amplify uh, further what I'm going to talk about. But um, firstly, I, I really have to thank NIUA um, and GIZ and, and UNEP for, in particular for sponsoring my participation. And I, I want to thank the previous speakers um, and everybody who spoke and participated yesterday because it's been an incredible learning journey. So I'm hoping I can share some information, but I've done an enormous amount of learning as well in the last couple of days. And I think that's an absolute key to everything about circularity and the circular economy is you've got to bring a learning mindset to it. No, no one of us in here, no one city, no one organisation has a mortgage on good ideas. And I think this is uh, so important because we've got so much to learn from each other. I'm going to talk about circularity as an economic driver. I'm going to flip the story, flip the approach. It links somewhat to Sharon's conversation about jobs. And, and, and perhaps this is another way to engage with city leaders about why adopting a circular economy is, is so important. So uh, I'm the Manager of Economic Development at the City of Hume. Uh, in the Australian context, we're in the City of Melbourne, we're an outer metropolitan municipality. Uh, in the Indian context, we're small, 250,000 people. But we have around 20,000 businesses um, 110,000 jobs. We're very strong in manufacturing, transport, logistics and construction, so we're very ripe for adopting circular uh, processes. And um, our gross regional product, the city's regional product last year was $15.6 billion. So we make a lot, we move a lot, we do a lot, and we have a lot of opportunity to engage with circularity. So what we believe is that adopting a circular model for your economy will profitably optimise resource usage, enhance productivity and profitability, reduce resource costs and waste disposal costs. Importantly, it'll catalyse innovation. It'll make manufacturing more competitive and it will open new marketing opportunities for manufacturing and create more jobs because more people worldwide are very attuned to this idea of uh, they want to buy a product that is circular. They want to buy a product that has green credentials. We, we see it in boardrooms in Australia where um, um, shareholders are demanding of boards, dump the bad stuff, bring on the good stuff. You know, get rid of all of your make, take and waste approaches and let's see circularity in what we do. So there's a lot of motivation out there. 
So in, in the city, um, we designed a roadmap. We uh, did this back in 2019, before circularity was sexy. We actually were onto it and we started um, engaging in the space. So we've got a few years of experience behind ourselves now, uh, which has been terrific. What we have learned is collaboration is absolutely key. So we work with industry, and for industry in Hume, we deliver a bespoke uh, a, a training program with a bespoke roadmap as the outcome for each business. So Nestle, the chocolate manufacturer, has undertaken our program. They come out of the program with a circular roadmap for Nestle. We have lighting manufacturers, we have other food manufacturers, we have construction businesses. They've been undertaking these programs now for three years and every single one of them has now been implementing these roadmaps. So we are influencing the businesses in the city. This is not just about the work of the city, this is about the city as an influencer into business in the city. We're working with our community, we're helping educate them about hard waste. Um, we uh, uh, ran a, um, a digital um, uh, circular activator program last year where we got in, uh, the community to engage with ideas on how we could help reduce hard waste in the, in the city. So again, we talk to the people, we talk to the ratepayers. We don't tell them what to do or tell them what we think, we're asking them what they think and what they think that we should do and that gets them engaged. We're working with universities. I was very excited yesterday, the number of people, I don't think they're all here today, um, are working with Professor Usha uh, Laya Reniga in uh, RMIT University in Melbourne, and we're working very closely with Usha as well. Um, and uh, we've now realised that uh, there are people coming to Melbourne quite regularly, and so I'm going to meet more often and have more cups of tea and have more discussions and learn more, uh, which is fantastic. And we're working with the developers and the construction industry, and I was really impressed to hear about the, the very large um, recycling um, of construction materials that is happening here in this city, uh, which is fantastic. We, we have that happening as well in Hume, possibly in a smaller way, but it's really important to, to cleanse um, and reprocess these um, deconstructed uh, buildings so that they can be, they can be reused. Um, another way of doing this um, that we're doing in the city of Hume is with asphalt. We have a product which was uh, invented in the city of Hume and first laid back in 2018. And this was a bit of the initiator for us engaging on this circular journey. It's called Reconifolt. And Reconifolt uses recycled asphalt, crushed glass, soft plastics, so plastic bags from the shopping centre, and as the binding agent, instead of a very expensive polymer that used to be imported from France at great cost and impact on the environment, we use toner from toner cartridges, recycled toner from toner cartridges. The product is better than the traditional product that's made with all virgin resources. So it's a very, very, very circular product. And, uh, and to give you an idea um, of some of the statistics, just quickly rattle a couple off before I finish. So as an example, um, so this is in the Australian context, so it's a little bit smaller, but in 2021, we laid 30 kilometres of new road in the city. Every kilometre of road uses 530,000 plastic bag, that's my alarm, rather than a <coughs> Today, I actually have an alarm telling me to shut up. Um, 530,000 plastic bag and packaging equivalents, 168,000 glass bottle equivalents, toner from 12,500 printer cartridges, and 134 tonnes of reclaimed road asphalt. So that's in every kilometre. Now this product, having been trialled in Hume in 2018, is now being rolled out right across Victoria and elsewhere in Australia. And in the last 12 months, Reconifolt has reused 46 million plastic bags, 20 and a half tonnes of uh, recycled asphalt, 1.3 million used toner cartridges, and 11 and a half million uh, recycled glass bottles. So that, there's an example. Now, why did we do that? 
One of the local businesses approached me as the economic development manager and said, I've got an idea. What do you think about this? So at great danger to myself, I went to the engineers in the city and said, what do you think about this? And they went, yeah, let's give it a try. But it had to be tested. They had to be convinced. So there's that element of work. But they tried it. And now it's just happening everywhere. So I think some of the lessons that I've learned from my journey, which has now been over nearly uh, four years, is that cities can make a difference. And it's not just about what cities do. It's about how cities influence their community, their business community, their ratepayer community. Cities can influence up as well as down. We are local. We're the most connected. We're the people who know our businesses. We're the people who know our people. Much more so than a state government or, or a federal government. You must adopt a learning mindset. Collaboration is absolutely key to everything that we do. You have to build that coalition of the willing. We did develop a business case to take our project to our city. So a business case can be very, very useful. We engaged with uh, KPMG. And the program rollout, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be gradual, and it has been. Um, it needs education and it needs constant engagement. Some of the organisations that we're collaborating with, KPMG, who uh, helped us with the business case and uh, delivering our education program for businesses, Arup, an Australian consultancy that's now worldwide, who are using circular design tools, circular construction tools and circular infrastructure tools, RMIT University that I mentioned before, and our community. We're also listening to our community. So that's the journey of the city of Hume in, um, in Melbourne, in Australia. And um, hopefully there's some useful information in there. And I've gone as quick as I can and still make some sense. Rakesh, I hope. <laughs> Thanks a lot, George. You've been wonderful. Um, questions? I think can, you can predict the first question, right? Like all speakers. <laughs> <laughs> No, is it a different one, Holger? <laughs> no, no, because it, it would make no, it would make sense. No, uh, just a question. How can I say? You are in charge of the, the business development unit in the uh, city council. Uh, that's not very loud. I can't. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So you are in charge of the business development unit. Economic development. Eco economic development. Yes. How can I say, uh, just to, to, to uh, let's say, somehow to, to share, I was in that kind of business in the city of Berlin in, in a public bank, so it was always hard, that's with my background, it was always hard to reach out to businesses and to, let's say, to get a real honest conversation in what to change because they have plenty of other concerns. So first question is, how do you manage to, let's say, be listened and how do you manage also to identify their, let's say, potential of change, of transfer and so on? And then how can you really support them? Do you give some, let's say, uh, advice, financial services, and so on and so on and so on? So what is your margin of doing this change? So how do we identify them? How do we engage them? And how do we support them? Yes. Identification is easy. easy. Every single business can adopt circularity because very few of them do at the moment. So what we tend to do is we then look at the businesses that have largest amounts of input uh, and potentially the largest waste streams. So we target manufacturers, food manufacturers, advanced manufacturers. Um, we have caravan manufacturers, uh, um, steel processing. Um, so we engage with them. Um, how do we engage with them is we tell them that this is a business imperative for them. If you don't get on board with circularity, you're going to be left behind. The market is going to move really, really quickly and you're going to be left behind because your competitor is going to be promoting a really good circular product and that's what people are going to buy because the market demand is now starting to happen. It's growing. A couple of years ago, yeah, so what? Exactly. It's an esoteric, you know, mumbo exactly. jumbo, green rubbish. Now, in the boardrooms around the world, as I said, shareholders are telling boards, come on, go green. Now, they're still using that sort of terminology, but what they're really saying is co circular. 
So we're saying to these businesses, here is your opportunity to catalyse innovation, to identify and, new and Are products. you showing that to them? Or yeah, 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 yeah. We're actually showing them. And, and as an example, we have a company in, in Hume now called Supercart, who make shopping trolleys for supermarkets. The basket is made entirely of recycled plastic milk bottles. And the number of supermarket chains that are going, we want that, is just going through the roof. So the ones who make the old steel baskets are going, hell, we need to do something here. We need to make something that's greener because we're losing market share. And I think we're at a tipping point. I think this is going to move in the business world, not in the government world. I'm in government. Very slow, yes. In the business world, this is going to take off. And I think cities have the ability to have this conversation and support and guide our business community. Now, is there a cost? There is a cost, but it's not that expensive in, in our context. And our city subsidises the cost as well. But for a business to participate in one of these programs that gives them a circular roadmap, after our subsidy, the cost is only $1,500. For what? $1,500. To undertake a training program which provides the business with a bespoke roadmap for how that business can become circular. I see. And you, you, you have a sort of business, let's say, consultant network, I Yeah, yes. Yeah. KPMG are delivering that program for us at the moment. Um, we will probably put out an expression of interest uh, to see out of all of the new consultancies that are coming out of the ground, um, whether there is somebody else who can offer a better product but at the time we started, three years ago, KPMG had the best product in the market. But circularity is an absolute growth area in, in the city, um, uh, in, in Australia as well, in terms of consultancies. They are um, they're popping up like lawn sprinklers at the MCG. They're just <laughs> coming up. Uh, think Alexander, you had a question here? You please pass. And Bharat also. Yeah, thanks again for a very insightful presentation, George. Um, a quick question complementing what Holger said. What's your leverage against the, uh, the companies? Why do the companies listen to you? Uh, I think I'm just complementing what Holger was saying. Uh, it may be um, business as usual for you in Australia, but there are many countries where businesses don't really interact with the local authorities. And hence the question. I, I think our leverage is that uh, we're offering something to help them and uh, in the Australian context, we come as a sort of a trusted neutral broker. Um, I mean, you know, they're a business, they employ people. That's important for us. Um, and by going circular and improving their products and improving their market share, they'll employ more people. That's good too. And a manufacturer has second and th third order jobs providing the inputs. So they'll grow. So that's, you know, more jobs, which is great for the city. Um, our leverage is really just we can get in the front door and have a conversation with them, being from the, from the city, and we can say to them, we can help you, uh, and there's this program that can help you, and these are the things that we'll do, as I said before. Grow your market, improve your sales, reduce your overheads, reduce costs, waste costs one business's waste might be another business's input. So rather than business A paying money to have its cardboard carted off to landfill, business B will come and collect it for free and use it to make recycled cardboard, something as simple as that. So, so we kind of broker those conversations and discussions. I'm hoping there'll be a time where we'll be redundant because businesses will have got this. They'll understand circularity and they'll be doing this themselves, but we're not there yet. So uh, I would like to ask you uh, how you have been able to, you know, integrate the circularity principles within the local legislation, because you might be having local laws and it has been always a challenge to, you know, add on circularity principles, because defining the milestones or the output is really challenging. Yeah. Very good. Good question. I mean, I, I work in government just the same as the, the city officials here do. So we had to build a business case and we had to take it to our city council. We had to present it to them and we had to get them to understand what we were proposing to do. The city wants to, itself wants to have better 
um, climate change credentials. And it's now seeing that by the city helping business community adopt circularity and by the city itself undertaking circularity and using recycled building materials and using roads like Reconifold, the city's contributing to its climate change agenda. So absolutely, yeah, I couldn't be doing this if I didn't have the support of, in the Australian context, our mayor and our councillors. Um, they give me the power to, to do what I'm doing. So very important. And the business case that was developed that showed how this would work was important. I couldn't have articulated it myself. I needed the help of the business case, which was prepared by a consultancy. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, on that note, I uh, feel uh, let's, uh, let's close right now and go for a quick break. Uh, we'll come back in about 10 to 15 minutes for the closing session where we have the dignitaries also joining us. I hope you had a wonderful time. Can we have a nice round of applause for George, please? Thanks a lot. Uh, we have some tea and snacks waiting for you. And yeah, don't forget to talk to each other. If you found some of these presentations interesting, especially the city officials, feel free to say hello and ask them more questions. And we also have some fun um, uh, frames set up here, the yellow, blue, and green frames that you see on the side. So if you want to do some social media posting, feel free to use that. <laughs> you also have the Circular Cities tagline on that. So go on, have some fun. We'll get you back in for the closing session. And after that, we'll go for lunch. Actually, uh, why don't we do something? Can we have the whole organizing team here, please? Gaurav, Sonali, Shubhi, Kinshu, Naveen, Naveen especially, Chandan, please come on stage. Kathy, please join us on stage here. Also, our wonderful volunteers from Opi Jindal University, Taha, Samrit, Abhishek. Can we all? Can we have all of you on stage? Yes, on stage. Please, pick up the stage. It's the most amazing team to work with. Please give them a big hand. They've done a lot. <laughs> Someone has to say. <laughs> and I'm very proud to have been part of this team. They were super accepting and we just managed to get working right from the word go. So it's been an amazing collaboration with NIUA. Thank you so much again, Hitesh, for enabling this. And CEW also, Shuva, from your side. Uh, it was not easy bringing all our forces together. And of course, another big hand to you, Holga. Thanks for being sort of the man in the background, <laughs> helping us out all the time. And uh, this couldn't have been possible without us, without you, without us. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm at the end of my <laughs> energy levels, so don't mind <laughs> all the stuff. So over to you then, Paramita. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rakesh. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible if you were not the bridge between us, UNEP, GIZ, and CEW. So you formed that bridge, and that's why we could do it. And without the backing of our director, who, who just gave me total freedom to do whatever I wanted to do, it couldn't have been possible without him. It's a really humbling moment for me. Thank you so much. Uh, with that said, a very good afternoon to the dignitaries, Mr. Ashok G. Ashok Kumar, Director General NMCG, Mr. Jagdale, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Re uh, Renewable Energy, uh, Mr. Ravinder uh, from the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and our friend Nicola who has been our advisor all through, specifically advising us in the U20 process. It is my honor to present a summary of this 
very, very engaging and action-packed workshop, uh, sorry, conference on circular cities. Uh, <coughs> before I get down to the session and the activities, uh, let me give you a brief context about why we decided to hold this workshop and that too now in March, where there is so much activity happening. So we all understand that the concept of circular economy is not new, but it has really gained a lot of momentum, primarily due to the disruptions in critical supply chains as a consequence of the COVID pandemic that we all went through. And uh, this also has got the backing of none other than our Honorable Prime Minister, who launched the uh, LIFE mission in October last year. And this mission very explicitly promotes the concept of circular and sustainable lifestyle. And it strives to replace the use and make, take, uh, make, take and dispose a linear economy with that of a circular economy. So what more can we ask for none, uh, if we have the support at the top level? So NIVA has been very fortunate and privileged to be part of the technical secretariat of the U20 that is being supported by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. And uh, there are six uh, key priority areas of the U20 cycle, this being the sixth U20 cycle that India is uh, holding the presidency of. And the six key areas that have been identified of for the U20 cycle this year are encouraging environmentally responsible behaviors, ensuring water security, accelerating climate finance, championing local identity, reinventing frameworks for planning and governance, and catalyzing digital urban futures. So if we look at circularity, it actually cuts across all the six priority areas, but more specifically the first one, which is on encouraging environmentally responsible behaviors. So we see this conference as a platform for cities to learn from each other and also from other stakeholders like experts, academia, businesses, NGOs, and think tanks. And if we want to drive home the concept of circularity, then we all agree that cities are the front runners in this and they are the drivers. So we therefore desi designed an interactive ideas where all the stakeholders could come and speak to each other in larger groups, in smaller groups, through breaks and through different activities. So if you have a look at the agenda, it's a little unconventional and I must acknowledge the help we got from Rakesh with all his international expertise on this to make it so interesting and I hope all of you agree that you really we all really enjoyed being here together. So uh, we began the plenary session on international perspectives. Uh, the panel included Mr. Tejas Bhandari from Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation. As you know, Ahmedabad is the U20 uh, host city uh, for India this year, and uh, uh, they are also the Sherpa for the mayor's uh, conference that is coming up uh, in July this year. We ha also had with us Ms. Antia Berger from the German Embassy, Mr. Holger from GIZ, Ms. Sharon Gill from UNEP, and Mr. Nicola from the Global Solutions Initiative. And this was moderated by Ms. Shuva from CEW. So Ahmedabad being the U20 Sherpa city, briefed us with all the circular efforts that they are carrying out in the area of transport, water, wastewater, and solid waste management. The city has also come up with a novel uh, and innovative circular instrument like the Environmental Improvement CES, Circular Finance, and they have also set up an uh, energy efficiency cell where they are working on solar and wind energy. Ms. Berger talked about the relevance of circular economy across sectors and the projects that the German Technical Cooperation is carrying out in India. Uh, Holger and Nicola, Nicola elucidated about the circular economy sounding board, the interacting platform, and the efforts of the Global Solutions Initiative, and informed participants about the upcoming event of the GSI in May in Berlin, where we hope to see as many of you, and the book on resources for the future that is going to come up. In the parallel thematic sessions, uh, all of us learned about some best practices in waste, sanitation, water sectors, in habitat and governance, 
and on energy and mobility. We had presentations and very, very uh, unique discussions between the commissioners, additional commissioners and representatives from all the different sectors. Some of the key takeaways that I got from the session was that if we talk about waste management or any other sector, it is the engagement of and collaboration of everyone that matters. Passionate leadership is key to all this. Combination of decentralized and centralized solutions and out of the box thinking with in a, in also in a planned manner with long term, medium term and uh, uh, short term plans being prepared where in order to achieve sustainability and all this is key to achieve, achieving circularity in a city. Uh, in the peer circles, we had smaller group uh, presentations in a trade fair booth kind of style where all participants first heard about innovation, innovative solutions from startups and other business providers from both national and international uh, scales. Uh, being mindful of the time, I'm reading, not reading out on the names, you, have, you can see that on the agenda. The key takeaway from this session was that the cities found the conference to be a very good platform where they get an opportunity to discuss this with the solution providers in smaller groups so that that can be more engaging and fruitful. It was interesting to see how the city officials talked very openly about their challenges and we actually witnessed some matching happening over there, matchmaking happening over there. And we are very happy that we were able to provide that platform. The format uh, was very well received and uh, we've already got a lot of uh, uh, demand from cities that they want to do more such, they want to have such a platform where they can freely discuss and look out for solutions. Uh, we had some interesting innovations that were being presented uh, through very, very short pitches in the OctiTank session. Uh, and uh, we called it OctiTank because Octopus is very intelligent and we need intelligent solutions. Um, and uh, they are, all these were very scalable and practical solutions that can be quickly delivered. And on day two, that is today, uh, we had presentations of, uh, from four tools on measuring circularity. Each one is unique as well as complementary. Uh, so being mindful of the time, I will not elaborate on the tools, uh, but what, what we learned is that if we work together collaboratively and complement each other, we can go a long way in this whole effort towards circularity. With that said, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so I would now like to invite our dignitaries on stage for the, uh, for the closing session. Uh, may, may we please have all of you on stage, Mr. Jagdale, Nicola, Mr. Ravinder, and uh, Ashok Kumar, sir. And Shubha. And Hitesh, sir. You can be here. So over to Shubha now. Thank you, Paramita. And a very warm welcome to our valedictory session dignitaries. And we have three gentlemen who have defined the energy, waste, and uh, water nexus of India over the past several years. And we're very fortunate to have this intersection here for the final session. So we have Mr. Ashok Kumar, who leads the Namami Gange program, the Clean Ganga Mission. We have Mr. Dinesh Jagdale, Joint Secretary, uh, Minister of New and Renewable Energy. He is in charge of our renewable energy. Uh, once every gigawatt, now 500 gigawatt, there are many things going on. He'll tell us a little bit about it. And we have Mr. Ravindran, who is uh, with the Ar Swach Bharat Urban Mission. And we have with us Nicola. We have Mr. Vedya, of course. He's going to, uh, he says he will not say something, but maybe if you think something is yet to be said, please do chip in, sir. Yeah. And we have Nicola, who's our lead moderator, and he's going to start off with one question to each of our uh, panelists. And okay, so we have a very aggressive timing thing also, so we want to keep your uh, replies to three to four minutes, not more than that. And we also have a very general audience, as you can see, so we would like to keep the answers a little broad based. 
Nicola, over to you. Shuva, thank you so much. Just for the sake of time, at what time do we need to wrap up this uh, discussion? I think by 1.30 should be good, 30 minutes. Right. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank I, you I hope everybody has time because we're starting a little later than we had yeah, planned. Okay, so yeah. thank, you. thank you very much. It's uh, a, a real pleasure to be here uh, after this uh, incredible journey in the past uh, one and a half days. Uh, I think you have uh, felt the energy and the passion in the room uh, on a topic which is sometimes a little bit uh, difficult. Circular economy, uh, resources for the future, uh, as a, as a concept as it is uh, positioned here, but uh, people stayed. Right? That's a good that's a good sign. Um, of course, they stayed because they knew you would be coming, uh, <laughs> but uh, and they were very eager to show their interest. But uh, the way I think this uh, was uh, crafted uh, with the with by an IUA with uh, with UNEP uh, uh, with the strong input from uh, uh, GIZ. Uh, the different partners and the Global Solutions Initiative. Uh, I've got colleagues from GSI here also, which I am humbled to represent as a, as a fellow, is uh, one illustration of uh, how things are changing quickly. If we would have had this conference maybe five or ten years ago, it would have been a lot about development cooperation and uh, uh, learning from best practices and uh, how could be uh, some of them implemented in the Indian context and we, then we have uh, bumped in the issues of capacity building and then somebody would have raised the uh, issue of the lack of capital and so on. Uh, turning the page and now, I think uh, it's not just uh, a few years later, it's a leapfrogging. Um, we have uh, different national programs, flagship programs, the Gang uh, uh, revitalization program with here, um, uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar as the Director General of the National Mission for Clean uh, Ganga. Uh, we have the uh, major issue of uh, the renewables and energy transition, which is uh, an overarching topic, not just in India, but for the whole G20, if not the world, right? Uh, with uh, Dinesh Dayan and uh, Jack Jacques Daly as Joint Secretary for the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. And we have something that is always typically considered as something on the side because it's about the waste. No, waste is not uh, very attractive all the time, but uh, obviously it's something very central. So thank you uh, very much, GB uh, Chavinder, for joining us. And this triptych we are preparing, this is tri triptych or troika, right? Uh, under the issue of uh, uh, circularity when we uh, heard yesterday from our colleague from Ahmedabad and other cities which were featured here, that Ahmedabad as the host also of the, uh, uh, um, of the uh, Urban 20. Uh, now things are being put in place, um, not just uh, 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 nationally or not just locally, but with a greater understanding of all the links of interdependencies and interlinkages, which in the context of an initiative that a lot of people here in that room, from students to highly trained professionals and political leaders, have been part of in the last 18 months through the circular economy solutions dialogues when we dealt about plastics and global supply chains and urban metabolism and other factors. I think our common learning journey is about how to manage sectoral programs, sometimes with a lot of very significant multi-year funding, but also how to improve our common ability to work across interdependencies. And I think uh, Itesh Vaida, as the Director General of NIUA, will not contradict me in saying that maybe one important and underestimated lesson from the urban people is to share with others, always with passion, about how to manage such high level, necessary, and sometimes uh, uh, difficult levels of and, uh, interdependencies uh, at different levels. I will stop here for those very few words of introduction um, and just saying again that we are delighted to have this uh, closing discussion and I hope uh, it will be, uh, it will be a, a useful moment. Let me just also refer to what Parameter mentioned, otherwise I will forget about that uh, because m many of you have asked the questions about what will happen afterwards, right? Um, so after 1.30 or 2 o'clock, uh, this is not the end of this journey, of course not. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we will be reporting, there will be the usual conference reporting, but also in Berlin in uh, mid-May at the Global Solutions Initiative, we will hold an 
open discussion about circular economy and for sure uh, the G20 India and the different illustrations and initiatives here uh, will be part of that discussion. And after that, uh, by, uh, 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 by the fall or by September, we do intend to publish a physical book uh, about uh, these experiences and so on. So this is really part of a, a long discussion process. Um, Ashok uh, Kumar, as a part of this uh, clean uh, Ganga uh, 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 mission, uh, over the years, the program has been enlarged and transformed. It's one of the flagship also uh, program probably about the environment in India. And recently at the COP26, you were also like expanding uh, with the linkages like in the Scotland or the Thames in London and, and so on. What would be at this point to start our discussion, the, the, how would you describe the, the main challenge of not just starting but implementing in the long run a program about a river which is so important for so many reasons in India, but also completely cross-cutting across uh, so many uh, jurisdictions of all sorts. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. And I uh, congratulate the organizers of this conference because it's at the right time uh, we are having this conference. And uh, again, uh, thanks for inviting me uh, because uh, Namami Genge has just been uh, recognized as one of the 10 flagship programs of the world by the UN in the COP20. And one of the reasons for that was the, uh, the, the evaluation criteria which it had was uh, one, uh, which was stopping the environmental degradation, reversing it, and then people's participation. So in this uh, process, um, uh, the reverse rejuvenation has been uh, taken up as one of the major uh, uh, impact areas in the world. And uh, Namabhengenge has been doing a lot of work on the circular economy part of it. And uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> um, Honorable Prime Minister who heads this national mission for clean Ganga had come out with the concept of uh, of uh, Ardha Ganga, which means that uh, which make a bridge between ec people and uh, a river through an economic bridge. And, and one of the pillars of that is uh, recycling of water and uh, monetization of sludge. So uh, if you look at it, uh, the sustainability of the program, which we have been doing it for uh, many years and, and then trying to clean up this uh, river Ganga, and its tributaries uh, is very much dependent on the uh, circularity of the water because uh, <coughs> for a river there should be water flowing in the river otherwise it's not a river it could be uh, just a, a stagnant pool which is the case like in Emuna where you have uh, the stagnant water and because of that there's a lot of dirt so if you want to have a river first of all there should be it should be flowing there should be water in it and it should be flowing and uh, also, the, uh, uh, to the, the problem which we find in uh, Ganga, the shortage of water is primarily because of the excessive drawal of water for irrigation purposes. So uh, irrigation accounts for 85% of the water utilization in the country. And the dams which, built, uh, which are built on the upper parts of the Ganga uh, draws in a lot of water. And that actually uh, reduces the flow of water and impacts the environment of the river the fissures, the biodiversity is all affected by the uh, absence or, or the less water flowing in. And that actually unfortunately is uh, replaced by dirty water from the sewage and the industrial effluents. So not only good wa water is prevented from flowing into the river, but we are having dirty water from the, uh, uh, from the uh, industrial effluents and the agriculture, uh, f uh, the runoff from that and the sewage replacing that good water. So that's where the biggest challenge. So the uh, best way to address this issue is to have the circularity where the uh, water used in agriculture can be the water which is uh, taken up uh, from the sewage, treated water can be brought back for irrigation purposes, which in turn would uh, sort of uh, uh, reduce the abstraction of water from the good sources. So if you look at it, uh, that's the best circularity of it. That means uh, you the, the water which is presently being drawn from, uh, good water presently drawn from a river as well as the groundwater can be replaced by the treated water from the sewage plants which we are building. And that 
uh, uh, can make two things happen. One, uh, the secularity will be there. And second, the reduces the abstraction of water from the groundwater table, and uh, and in thereby reducing the exploitation of groundwater. And second, it also lets good water to flow down the river. So these two things are affected. Uh, uh, appreciated that. That's why, when the prime minister who understood this concept and said that we should have focus on uh, on um, rejuvenation of uh, uh, sorry on uh, uh, monetization of dirty treated water and also monetize the sludge. We have actually <coughs> taken up a lot of initiative in that. We have tied up with the, uh, the uh, many agriculture uh, departments of the states to check up, to use, uh, to promote uh, the usage of treated water. The second, we are tied up with the, uh, with the industry, industrial uh, establishments, particularly the, uh, uh, one, moment. one more minute, how many minutes? I, I think, sir, if you don't mind hearing, maybe Achha. So where is the timing coming up? I want to know where the timing is coming up. It will be flat. Okay, fine. So I have to put. Ah, so second important thing is that we have tied up with the, uh, uh, the thermal power plants. Um, almost 13, uh, we have started with 24, but uh, ended up with uh, about 13 thermal power plants, uh, which are uh, 50 kilometers on the radius of the existing STPs. We are tied them, uh, tied up with them for that they use the treated water for their, uh, uh, for their uh, um, non-potable purposes. And also we are tied up, uh, we are already supplying uh, treated water to the IOCL in Mathura in for the one of the users. So this is one uh, very major uh, trust which Namami Gengi have taken up. Second very important thing is uh, we are estab establishing uh, CETP is common uh, effluent treatment plants, the one in Kanpur which is coming up, which I was there <coughs> yesterday also, where the resource is being re recovered from the effluents of the tannery of the, and the chroma, chromium and etc. is being re recovered and uh, the water is actually put back to the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the industry and we are looking at a zero liquid uh, discharge concept. So that again is one of the very major th in the interventions which we are making. And similarly, uh, the sludge which comes out of the, uh, the, uh, the treatment plants, which is we are now finding it difficult to dispose of the sludge. So sludge is another uh, important uh, 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 outcome of uh, the, sorry, uh, uh, byproduct of the treatment plants, which we are now trying to make it as a fertilizer or a, or a uh, soil conditioner by appropriately adding uh, the or fortifications to be done and then use it for the economy. So that's a natural, uh, natural farming. So it all fits into the entire picture where we are promoting natural farming, uh, where also we look at the reduction of the use of uh, chemical fertilizers in, in agriculture, where we try to replace those chemical fer fertilizers by the soil conditioners from the, uh, from the, uh, from the sl uh, sludge, etc., etc. That is one another circularity we are talking about. A uh, national mission for clean Ganga has come out with the national framework for use, uh, safe use of treated, uh, treated water, which we have sent it to all the states. And we have now formed the River City Alliance, the other group with NIU. The River City Alliance, uh, where we are telling that we should uh, uh, work together to use river as a growth engine. Because in India, river is actually uh, considered as a transporter of waste or take the waste from out from the city without uh, uh, actually understanding that there's a city above them also which things like that and dumps all the waste into it and you also get the waste from the previous city. So that linearity has to be changed, the linearity in thinking of the municipal commission has to change and uh, we are asking the municipal commissioners to think that the river which comes in should leave, uh, should go out of your city with the same quality or a better quality than it came in. That's what we are trying to look at it. So there again, uh, the uh, circularity concept comes in that the water which is uh, used in this uh, city should be treated and put back to the river so that it increases the uh, probably flow of water in the river and, uh, and also reduces the uh, BOD uh, load in that. So this, uh, this concept of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, uh, getting the municipalities involved in circularity, we have started the process long back. Thank you about it. And last point I would like to add is, uh, uh, there are also uh, the cross-cutting things about the, uh, transport, uh, the transportation factors, the er energy, etc. coming here. We find that uh, the decentralized solutions for uh, 
sewage treatment as well as distance solutions for rainwater harvesting so has been promoted so that the energy requirement to pump a lot of water from other parts of the uh, long distances like hyderabad you know a bot is pumped from 100 kilometers away so this type of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, systems which require a lot of pumping of water from large distance can reduce it so if the, the water is captured stored there and it is circulated in that uh, economy that would be much better to to for reducing the carbon content as well as reduce the carbon footprint thank you thank you thank you so much <laughs> I will have another question for you afterwards about what the G20 sequence can bring uh, to such a, a very, very large-scale program, but uh, I know Shuva is managing time very tightly, so, uh, and we need to, to move on. I will turn to uh, uh, Joint Secretary uh, Jack Daly about another uh, uh, very, very important and uh, uh, recent uh, national program um, about the energy transition and the uh, installation of over 500 gigawatt, right, of energy, electricity supplied by renewables and, or non-fossil fuel sources. Um, we have heard from uh, Dr. Kumar about uh, the different levels of interaction and thank you for finishing by highlighting the problem of the, sometimes the, the involvement at local level, right, and the fact that rivers are just considered as a second, second secondary issue. So in the context of uh, accelerating and implementing this energy transition, um, how do you view the uh, linkages between the national ambition and uh, the role of, let's say, cities uh, about uh, to accelerate the implementation? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It is, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, when Shua requested me two days back, it was uh, wonderful to see the circularity being discussed and uh, we being apart from the renewable energy side being invited to discuss on how our role has been till date. And obviously, uh, when Nicola asked about our ambitions, yes, our ambition is 500 gigawatt of non-fossil capacity to be installed by 2030. And we, we, when we have embarked this program, I think what we, three, uh, our three fundamental pillars of electricity is, one is obviously making access, making uh, energy available to the end user, the consumer, to the grassroots level, whether it's urban, whether it's rural. Second is making it secure, making it from your resources that you are comfortable with, and thirdly, making it green. And these fundamental energy parts of this entire transformation has led to this growth story and Honorable Prime Minister announced it in COP26 that we as a country who has committed to climate change, who knows the importance of climate change will now endure to have a very ambitious target of 500 gigawatt. What we have done to ensure this and how our uh, efforts are citizen focused, citizen centric energy transition is the theme that we talk about. Uh, so when we look at our various programs, and I want to really answer your question in, de in, in pinpointed is, when we talk about our programs, we talk about large solar parks, large wind parks. What does that bring? That brings greenness to the grid. That greens the grid. When we talk about our rooftops, we talk about rooftop programs. What does it do? It includes the consumer into the overall energy transformation system. What it does is it actually empowers the consumer to become a prosumer. A prosumer is that one who actually produces clean energy and also which consumes the clean energy at the same time, same point of time. So that we have done. The third thing is we want to bring every citizen into this transformation phase. So what we did is we tried to involve, uh, we tried to interact, we, tr we, we also tried to ensure that whether it's agriculture sector, whether it's health sector, very other, whether it's uh, the, the citizens, the consumer load in the cities or the rural villages, we have a program which you will be aware, ladies and gentlemen, it's called a PM Kusum, which solarizes the agriculture. One of the flagship program of the government of India, which empowers a farmer in the rural village to produce electricity from solar, meet his needs for irrigation, ensures that he only uses the water when he needs, because he is also ensuring that during the daytime he gets his energy. We also ensure that there is de-dieselization of the of the sector, diesel is reduced, so we ensure there is less carbon, less emissions or zero emissions. And we also ensure that if he's excessively generating, he's selling back to the grid and he's earning his livelihood. 
Now that kind of circularity is being bought when we are delivering our programs. Thank you for one minute, but let me complete it. Uh, so what we are trying to, to do with this is that we are trying to involve, empower the citizens in the circularity aspect. Circularity is not only electricity as we all spoke, it is also talking about waste wealth. And I think more importantly, you must have deliberated on the waste wealth. Our, the government of India, through its various programs, have also given a very due impetus on waste to wealth, whether it's waste to biogas, whether it's waste to bio CNG, whether it's best by a waste to electricity and all those programs with a very integrated effort of the government of India, including our ministry, we have done it. And recently you must have seen the amount of effort uh, in the budget that we have announced. There is a substantial uh, money uh, being given to the transformation into the gas sector as well. So when we do this, the, the, uh, the, we have a solar city program, we have a city program. What does that do is it actually entitles the city, urban cities, rural villages to come out on a very, uh, on, on a collective basis to do these programs. And I am sure I can announce it today. We have the Modera town which is 24 by 7, elect, uh, which is on solar. We were yesterday told that the one of the city in India which is in Madhya Pradesh will be the first net zero city on 3rd of May. Do you believe this, that the kind of India awareness it has, it will be, so when they are doing this program, it is not only of electricity, they do understand water, they do understand uh, the energy that is required for livelihood, mobility, cooking and various other aspects and all that, this is all come through the awareness, this is all come through the interministerial effort of the government of India and, and all you all who are sitting here and the, the think tanks who, who drive this uh, concept and making public aware. So there is, there is a lot of circularity that we do. I stop here. I think I have exceeded one minute more. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Secretary Jagdal, one question maybe for, to think about for the second round of uh, exchange if we have time is about, for, if I'm thinking about the situation of Indonesia yeah. um, a year ago when they kind of started also to engage into this uh, uh, energy transition, which India is also doing at an even larger scale, given the size of the country and the population. Uh, one major hurdle was how to convert international financing into financing that could apply, of course, nationally and then locally, because usually there are no tools. Or you have got existing programs from international financial organizations. I suppose this would apply also in the context of water. And then they came up with a number of solutions, including a new national organization to guarantee all the funding like, for the energy transition mechanism. So if we have time, it might be just interesting to lightly touch upon whether such issues are also uh, a, a priority. And then maybe uh, uh, with the uh, Itesh Vaida, uh, how cities can be accustomed, because whether it's India or France or Germany, etc. Uh, the situations are different, but the challenges do resemble a lot, right? So, but let's keep that for a, a second moment and uh, to uh, continue in this uh, 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 circulation of issues from water and wastewater and all related energy, uh, en energy issues and energy uh, uh, transition. Um, one of the uh, also uh, uh, long existing programs nationally in India, the Swatch Bharat Mission, has been there for a while now, and uh, you have had to cross a fantastic number of challenges uh, to implement it. <laughs> uh, you have tested solutions, some of them didn't work, you had to reorientate, etc. So at this, uh, at this moment, uh, in a nutshell, what would be the main gain after a few years of implementing this uh, uh, Clean, India, in Clean India mission? Maybe the measure of success? but also how you manage to overcome uh, uh, that such a considerable number of hurdles, especially because you were dealing with not just a couple of dozens, but uh, hundreds, if not a thousand, of sites in the country all at the same time. The floor is yours. We've got the mic here, and we have got our colleague with the flags uh, regarding the time. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so, so much, uh, Dr. Ravinder. Yeah, uh, with all uh, humility, I will say that Swachh Bharat mission, that is Clean India mission, is still a work in progress. One of the uh, six pointer skis you are mentioning, environmental behavior change. That is at the heart uh, of our uh, Swachh Bharat mission. 
So, uh, it is built on segregation of waste. I'll take a quick uh, tour that when Surat in 2000 uh, odd or ni late 90s, it had that plague, then only our country started thinking about municipal solid waste in the country in a scientific manner. Thereby, rules of 2000 came about after Supreme Court uh, set up the committee. Now we have the rules of 2016. Swaj Bharat Mission, we are actually thankful to the Honorable Prime Minister. Uh, probably no, no leader could have declared that sanitation is an issue for, on a very important occasion on the Independence Day. So once this come into the public domain, so we had to bring the rules also. We have realized that infrastructures, creating uh, processing plants and even having the fleet of uh, solid waste management thing does not uh, solve any purpose. So behavior change, if you, yesterday you had uh, communication with Indoor, Ambikapur, very good examples of uh, people's participation and uh, Pune, you had the informal sector uh, participation there and Kanpur, is a case in study. Our friend from JZ over there. They were they were a prime minister award winner in 2009 for solid waste management. Then they slipped back. So all this is happening. So administrative action and uh, pumping of uh, money, uh, capex into the system. All this uh, doesn't uh, finally deliver the solution. So we came about, you know putting ourselves onto the scanner, that is Swatch Survection. Every year we get into the cleanliness survey on a very wide citizen consultation mode. And that has become a, you know, almost like a governance and implementation tool because as Sir was also saying, now municipal com commissioners want to add a price to their desk that we are the uh, cleanest city. And we have categorized so many cities. So it is a still a, a journey, a work in progress. And coming to the Swaj Bharat Mission 2.0, we had from one mission from 2014 to 2019 20, extended up to 2021, where we basically achieved the toilet side. And of course, uh, maintenance side, everything, we are still working on that. Now we are concentrating on that. The size of the problem is processing is uh, for understanding of our friends every month we have to develop a processing complete processing facility for 4 million population equivalent so 5 years we, uh, we have to uh, do that every month we have to add 4 million population equivalent that is for 5 years 240 that is 24 crores Literally, we have to add. So that is a huge task. And uh, we, we, unless the developers and the investors get into the circularity of the whole issue, and fortunately, we have the environmental EPR also coming into play. So there is an opportunity that this uh, no longer is just uh, remain at a green level, clean and green, but also uh, is going on to uh, circularity issues. So I think uh, Swaj Bharat Mission benefits from the thought of uh, circularity coming into the government. It was done in 2020 under the Niti Aayog uh, mandated commission and we are part of it. And uh, once we, uh, whenever we look into the circularity issues, yes, we, we can say that Clean India Mission is contributing to that. We may not be totally, you know, uh, circular, but uh, maybe going towards recycling. Then, you know, reducing and all this, maybe in the next stage we'll be finally reaching up to circular issues. I, I hope uh, I have clarified my point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Ravindra. So, you have introduced also a very important notion, I think, uh, which is everything linked to behaviors and changing habits, right? Uh, and sometimes habits that have been there for such a long time that it seems they have been there forever and it might take forever to change them. Um, and I remember also when we had discussions about uh, these pathways of change, right? 
um, about managing waste and transforming waste that they are collected and sorted out, etc. Um, our colleagues uh, from, from France, for example, usually say in Europe, uh, in the large cities of Europe, Berlin, Paris, London, and so many others, uh, it uh, took about 130 or 40 years, right? to set up in place uh, uh, engineering of waste and uh, engineering that would uh, be consistent with municipal finance and municipal finance that would be consistent with uh, uh, sharing part of the national budget to that. And you know, uh, uh, reforms after reforms, a slow path, uh, etc. cetera, um, in uh, uh, India <laughs> is not exactly uh, the next 130 years we are talking about, right? So times is very, very compressed and in that sense, uh, uh, the ability to drive change and have uh, uh, citizens, but you mentioned also the role of the private sector uh, um, to be part of the uh, equations is absolutely fundamental. Sometimes it is underestimated um, what we need to push uh, uh, this, uh, uh, to push time <laughs> to go faster. And maybe uh, to, to finish this uh, first uh, 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 round table by also looking at the time, Itesh, um, as an urban specialist, you are a specialist like uh, of good whiskies, like a blend of uh, many different components or tea leaves or etc. How do you, what is your view about these uh, massive transformations in the energy sector or the uh, pursuit of the Ganga River uh, project or the Swachpara mission? How, how do you feel the role of cities should be or could evolve to contribute to a, I would say, a comprehensive transformation in all those domains. What would be, from your experience and maybe from the Urban 20 perspectives with all the exchanges that you are driving with other cities in the region and worldwide, a couple of ideas to take away from this discussion? Uh, no, sorry, I, I thought uh, I'll not be speaking. I'll only be giving vote of thanks because I will take a... Uh, use of the presence of the stalwarts who are technically uh, supporting and working with the cities. Uh, but what I, I, you know, if I have to ask from the National uh, Institute of Urban Affairs, I see uh, we are doing a lot of work. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of good practices are happening at the city. But, uh, but if we want uh, city officials to be really, uh, you know, leapfrogging the word you used, uh, is then uh, we have to have this language of circularity to be the language of cities. And for that, I think uh, uh, the, all these big uh, uh, visions or aspirations which we have, have to be translated to that language where cities start understanding the role, the need, and it should not be a top down, but it should start coming up from bottom up. And that requires a lot of handholding, skill set, and capacity issues. And I think they all have to be really thought of. So I think role of think tanks like National Institute of Urban Affairs, CEWD, is to really generate that demand, work with the cities at the ground level, uh, so that policies can only give an enabling framework. But enabling framework can, has to be implemented. And I think the more uh, thing, because these are sub subjects at the local level, need an action has to happen at the uh, local level. I think this needs to be translated to the local level. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Uh a uh, very insightful remark, and I think <laughs> because what we can see uh, a little bit the world, the world over, but especially as part of this Indonesia, India, then Brazil, Troika in the G20, is that uh, there is a different approach to the role of cities, uh, and that national programs or the uh, implementations of very broad ambitions cannot go without cities, but cities also have to evolve in the way they interact with these uh, uh, global and, and national directions. So for the, um, for the next stage of our, our discussion, Shuva or uh, uh, Paramita, I understand we have a little bit of time for Q&A, right? Uh, um, yeah, I would actually like to ask uh, if everybody has 10 minutes extra, can we extend the panel? Because we're over time already. Yes, we, have, we are we have three minutes over time. Can we, can we take, take five, more minutes. Can okay. we take f 10 more minutes of your time? Right, so fantastic. Right. Then we have time for uh, more of the Q and A, uh, Nicholas. <laughs> I, yes. Is there a vote of appreciation that we take yeah. ten more minutes? Yeah. So no, I actually want to bring in our city commissioners also for one uh, minute each. So we have several um, city representatives here. But before that, I want to have one specific question to all our three panelists. Unless Nicola, you have something more to ask. 
No, please go on, Shubham. No, because uh, because it involves the cities, and they have been working with international cities as well, and our cities have also been showcased internationally. And I want to ask Mr. Jagdale because he's working on something called the Energy Compacts Program with the, India as a global uh, champion for energy transition. And that has been something in which we've involved our smart cities for the last year and a half. Uh, I also want to ask uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar and uh, Mr. Ravindran that, uh, uh, I mean, you have covered a lot of ground, but when you talk of G20 or we talk of international platforms, a lot of times the best practice are only seen as coming in from outside, but we are handling millions and millions of people and a myriad of problems every day. So what are some of the best practices that you have already shared internationally or that we can showcase ahead? So we'll start with Mr. Jagdalle and then we'll uh, go to uh, uh, Mr. Ravi and we'll close, I think, with uh, Mr. Asok Kumar. And thank you. We'll, yeah, sir, yeah. No, yeah. Thank you and appropriate time to really uh, deliberate on this and inform the audience about yes uh, it's very uh, you know I'm really proud to mention here that India is a global champion in energy transition and this was announced in uh, by the UN and uh, when the UN energy dialogue was held and we were assigned to really create the further take this journey you know this is a decade of action by 2030 we have to ensure the SDG 7 is is fulfilled across all the entire world and India being a global transition a uh, global uh, energy transition champion uh, what we did is uh, you know we created a mass movement on ensuring that there is a larger participation on what an individual can do what a community can do what an industry can do what cities can do and what governments can do now what what they do is in the sense that how can they raise the level of their commitment towards green energy or what can do do towards complete circularity by 2030 and what is the amount so it was a voluntary as assignment which is a voluntary to all but glad that we were the amongst the top in the world that there were 22 such entities from the government of India including the government of India and various other institutions that came forward and voluntarily announced their targets about energy efficiency energy uh, renewable energy capacity addition and all other several aspects when we talk of SDG 7 and I would like to mention the you know cities you know this is, this is substantially and we talk about circular cities today there were six cities from various states that came forward and those six cities were Ayodhya from Uttar Pradesh, uh, Indore from Madhya Pradesh, New Town Kolkata from West Bengal, Pimpri Chinchwad from Maharashtra, Raurkela from Odisha and Surat from Gujarat. They voluntarily came forward, we, big round of applause for all of them. Uh, and subsequently to this, when they came up there forward, in, in front, uh, huge uh, thanks to the Shuas and the team, to actually took them to the level of micro planning and what they should do by end of 2013. Every year and every year they have to actually put their uh, plans and what they have achieved over the, over the last year. And then this goes on the, uh, to the UN as a report card. And uh, even though it's voluntary, there is, there is, we are all watching because this well, energy compact has to be measurable, has to be impactful, has to be sustainable. And this is the kind of commitment that we as Indian cities and we from all and very proud to ensure that these six cities are role model for the entire world. And when we talk about those top, top, top cities in the world, I'm sure all these cities which we are mentioning here, which are present here, it, nevertheless, they're not less, but they're equally good. And I'm sure over the next 10 years, they will be much brighter than they're what today in terms of energy, in terms of circularity, in terms of wealth improvement. Obviously, the last thing is improvement, the livelihood of the citizen who is staying in that city. Thank you. Thank, thank you very and, much. And just to add to what uh, Mr. Abdullah said, when the first round of commitments was over, India had given half the total commitments that came in from the world, $74 billion worth of commitments from across the world. India gave $36 billion of that. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Ravi and Mr. Yeah, just, just yeah. a quick note on that. Yeah. No, no, no. But, uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. But just uh, because you, you mentioned that in the cities, yeah. and we have also our uh, 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 cities here, and there will be uh, such an important review of the SDGs and SDG 11 at the UN in the beginning of uh, July would definitely make it a lot of sense. I was thinking that a number of these experiences from Indian cities could be brought to others. Yes. So yes. let's uh, keep on Perfect. checking how we could do that. So Shuva, continuing yes, sir, this uh, discussion with the... Kumar yeah. To talk of how we are influencing the global okay. uh, I'll take the mic from him so that he doesn't speak. <laughs> 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 uh, 
no uh, yes uh, see uh, water is water and waste waste water is very difficult uh, thing you know because people don't understand the value of it I mean, in energy you know probably you get some money out of it selling it uh, people uh, who get money out of it benefit out of it they always uh, try to join the movement so in water which is a very difficult uh, sector itself where over the years we are supplying free, free water and any type of metering itself is difficult it's a big challenge which we are facing and so but some of the things which uh, uh, we have done uh, which has really uh, caught the national and international attention are uh, the uh, at uh, the uh, the uh, ham model which we introduced we have introduced a system called the hybrid annuity model wherein uh, we uh, make the concessioner who built uh, the uh, the sewage treatment plants ma maintain it for 15 years and we pay the money uh, or distributed over 15 years that makes uh, the 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 uh, person who uh, the concession who builds it more responsible uh, to build it properly and also to maintain it this has been uh, one very good model because it also reduces the spread of money. We pay only 40% upfront and then the remaining 60% is spread over 15 years. So we could take up more projects with the same money because 100 rupees, we only pay 40 rupees for the one project. So we can take two and a half projects with the same 100 rupees. So the number of projects goes up and the, uh, the outcome of the project and the maintenance of the project is ensured because we pay the remaining money based on the outcome of uh, based on the uh, their their uh, key parameters if they meet for the 15 years that's one important pro pro program which we give to the world second is one city one operator concept also has been taken up and it's been replicated many uh, parts of the world and uh, taken out all over the world by the uh, the world bank so these are some of the innovations which we did and cities the river city alliance is another great innovation which we have done and uh, almost 109 cities have joined us in the pursuit to make River as one of the growth engines of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, yes, ma'am. And uh, uh, solid waste uh, management in general, we picked up a lot of things from Australia, Canada, European Commission, uh, uh, you know, uh, directions, etc. But ultimately, uh, this was a totally uh, Indian kind of implementation. Uh, worldwide technology revolution of especially social media uh, played a good role and uh, it became a very good uh, supporting thing for our champion cities. Now let me say that now indoor population is so much invested into uh, such surveillance that any uh, municipal commissioner who is coming there will be uh, hustled by the citizens to uh, be reaching the number one point. The same population of course, we are to, you know, reach all the cities like that. Same population, same citizenry, because of earlier culture, was the biggest hurdle today. But for a city, champion city, they are the biggest source of energy for that. So it is a purely in there. Another thing uh, that I want to say, may, it may not be available anywhere. Our, uh, you know, in Indian uh, society, we have a lot of gender issues, etc. And self-help groups have come up, particularly Sir knows after Chandra Babu Naidu. Uh, so, in Orissa and Chhattisgarh, we have the biggest models of uh, SHG group led uh, sanitation uh, enterprises uh, which are delivering the services and doing excellently. So, that is a good model and um, uh, may not be for the developed country, but I am happy to say that people from Bangladesh, Vietnam, have visited actually Indore and Ambikapur, uh, uh, um, probably Ambikapur they have not visited, Indore they have visited and uh, even Japan people also came and visited uh, uh, Indore and they felt very happy that is truly it is uh, proving to be a uh, clean city. So I think it is a truly Indian type of uh, designing the uh, process and implementing it. Uh, we did not uh, copy from anywhere and I think uh, other uh, countries also may need to do their own uh, customization when they implement it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I'm going to take, um, we actually over the last two days had more than 100 participants of which 35 were from cities. 
some of them have left a little earlier, but I'm still going to read out the cities that participated. And then I want to request the city people to please stand up and just say hello to our guests. And uh, maybe in a minute, because there's quite a few of you, uh, what is your one key takeaway from the time that you've spent with us today? What would you like to see forward? So we've had with us uh, Ahmedabad, Ambikapur, Indore, Pune, Gwalior, Coimbatore, Hyderabad, Trivandrum, Kochi, Kanpur, Port Blair, Vijaywada, Vishakapatnam, Chennai, Shimla, Amritsar, Leh, Imphal, and Agartala. So I think that is a robust representation from across India. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, so if the, if the representatives who are still here may please stand up. And I would request, uh, of course, uh, we have Mr. Bhandari, who's also the uh, U20 Sherpa, but I'll come to you last, because then you can summarize. No, but please uh, stand. And you can just maybe, if we have a mic. We have two people with the mic. Yeah. And just introduce yourself and So I think let's keep passing on. Namaskar, myself Asha Raut, Deputy Commissioner of Pune Municipal uh, Corporation. Really, it was a great opportunity to all of us. Cities as a drivers, we get here the uh, think tank and we want as a city to speed up with the help of with the all toolkits here. Thank you. Namaste sir. My name is Kotis Rao from uh, Greater Hyderabad Municipal Corporation. After coming to this, uh, I came to not, uh, know that uh, we are uh, doing circular economy. <laughs> 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 that words is different, but uh, we, uh, we are doing, sir. In solid waste management, we are doing, because uh, for the SARS information, we are uh, operating a 24 megawatt uh, waste energy plant, sir, successfully. Yes. It is a 98 uh, percent efficiency. We are enhancing it to 48 megawatt and by this May, under 14.5 megawatt also will come into operation at Bindigal. And uh, our plan is to, our ministers uh, targeted uh, like uh, 100 megawatt uh, by next couple of years. For that, uh, they are, uh, we are going to, uh, maybe within two years, 15 megawatts also extra will come. And also CND also we are recirculating that the material. That year one challenge we are facing is regarding sludge. That the silt uh, because of composition of our hydrobed uh, waste, silt is coming more. That uh, maybe uh, I posed a this uh, challenge in the uh, study meeting. So some of our uh, XCE has given some solution we try to implement and uh, also explore there are so many um, fields for circular economy I came to know. I try to highlight uh, with the uh, higher ups so that the circular economy will be increased in the Hyderabad city. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste sir. Uh, uh, myself Tejas Bandari. I am Deputy Commissioner Amdavad Municipal Corporation. Uh, this has been a very, uh, this is, has been a very really uh, learning session and we all benefited from it. Uh, my key away, uh, my key takeaway from this conference is to break away the silos which is existing in different departments of our uh, organization and uh, because circular economy is a one thing that in uh, one or another case we are practicing but we need to have more energy between the departments. So uh, that is my key takeaway. And uh, your sirs, your presence has really been very inspiring for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Namaste, sir. I'm Sachyavati, Additional Commissioner, Vizayawada Municipal Corporation. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this conference is uh, very much useful to us. We are all implementing whatever the key points we are, whatever we are discussed. But it is very much help to us, uh, very much better in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. I am Pratishtha Mamgai, uh, 2018 batch IS officer, currently posted as Commissioner in uh, Mikapur. It was a great learning experience because not only we had exposure to uh, other case studies from the country, but also internationally. Um, one request would be that there should be greater focus on smaller cities, sir, because particularly in Indian context, we are rapidly urbanizing. 
So we need to focus more on the smaller cities and how they cope up with the solid waste management. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Ashish Kohli, Commissioner Municipal Corporation, Shimla. It was a great learning experience and would, I would try to implement the things I have learned here. My request to uh, uh, Rajinder sir would be like in Swachh Bharat Mission, we have tried to improve our position. We came from uh, uh, 102nd to 56th position uh, last year and uh, we are trying to improve it further. But I think uh, like a lot of hand holding is required for the, all the ULBs. Uh, we keep on improvising upon ourselves. We are at sea most, most of the times, like how the waste is to be processed, be it uh, say waste to energy plant, or be, be it uh, from waste to uh, say composting plant. So if uh, some agencies could be impaneled uh, by say the government of India, it would, be, uh, it would uh, benefit the ULBs at the field level. Thank you so much. Point well noted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Ishan Namgyal. I am from Leh Municipality. Uh, I am elected representative. I am the president there. So it was a great learning to play form. In fact, uh, the bottom line which I learned is live simply, reduce, reuse, life, there's life. <laughs> <There's> life. <laughs> and sir, that goes very well with the concept of, uh, you know, Buddhist soci socialism. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Last but not least. Good afternoon. I am Vinu Francis, uh, Secretary of Trivandrum Corporation, like a uh, commission of states. Uh, see, we have three stalwarts uh, from a uh, different uh, thematic area, like uh, water supply, sanitation, and uh, energy. Uh, fortunately, Trivandrum Corporation uh, uh, so recently joined us the city, River City Alliance uh, last month, maybe or not eight them as a member, and uh, selected the uh, Solar City by the ministry. Also, the Sajwad mission, we are in 2014-15 uh, onwards. Okay. See, uh, these are uh, working towards the uh, carbon neutral that is committed by the government of India by 2070. Uh, many of the cities have already initiated some of the uh, strategic movement towards achieving this. Uh, like uh, Mumbai have started with this kind of things, committed to have these kind of things in 2050. So we are also Trend Corporation also explain the possibility of combining all these activities, these kind of things, to have these kind of things by 2035. That is our takeaway from this section. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. With this, uh, um, I will pass it on to Itesh for the vote of thanks. Stay with us this afternoon. We are no, no, this afternoon, no. It's worth free to go. So Itesh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Mr. Ashok Kumar ji, uh, Mr. Uh, Jagdale sir, uh, Ravindra ji, all the participants. You know, vote of thanks after such a energetic discussions is very difficult and I hope I'll keep the energy uh, uh, intact. You know, when uh, Nicholas, uh, my friend who is moderating this session, was talking Trioka, I was remembering uh, in Indian mythology there is called Trimurti. Uh, three Murti is creation, preservance, and destruction. But Trioka of water, waste, and energy, all three together, each one of them have a, their independent role to play. But their collective effort will definitely take us to the next level, a common goal which we all are really striving for. for thanks for all three of you uh, coming here and joining us and guiding us on this. You know, while we are talking about circularity and I, I will talk about three lines which or four lines I will quote from yesterday's address by the Pri Honorable Prime Minister uh, to 5000 practitioners and he said that India is making the circular economy a major basis for urban development. Um, and I will not quote out but last sentences which because some of them you said it, our new cities must be garbage free water secure and climate resilient. The Prime Minister also remarked 
and highlighted the need to increase the investment in urban infrastructure planning and circular economy in tier 2 and tier 3 cities uh, rather than only in the big cities. So I think a lot of discussions with our cities really talked about, he did mention about uh, that. So uh, really, you know, thank you. And I think he, uh, the policy also reflects the need and the demands which are coming up uh, from the city level. So I think that's a great movement for all of us to talk about, like we are talking about yesterday onwards circular economy and our Honorable Prime Minister has in his address talked about circular economy as a major point of uh, future development in urban areas. While this workshop has happened, uh, you know, uh, thanks to Holger, uh, the other day we, he, you know, uh, Nicholas and Holger asked us that they wanted a space uh, to have their discussion on a, a book uh, called Intersection and uh, I was very happy that, you know, uh, a multinational organization coming to my office and it will give me a little bit of a good, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, feature me, uh, my organization better in, in a social media. I said, why don't you use, use my, my space to have this workshop and, um, uh, you know, and that came up this idea of uh, having this uh, workshop on circular economy. So, so, so I think thanks to both of them to really starting the seed uh, for, for this uh, discussion on circular economy. And, and while we are discussing uh, about circular again, I remembered while we were sitting next to him, you know, what is this workshop really, really uh, uh, bringing out? Why are we doing this workshop, you know, with the listening uh, uh, from last, uh, you know, all the stalwarts sitting here, as well as uh, all the cities and uh, participants. Uh, I remember a story of when in, uh, in from the Indian mythology that a churning of ocean was happened to find the nectar of immortal, uh, uh, immortality. And that nectar of immortality, gods and demons fought together. But what they got out of it was everything which they wanted to preserve to take the universe further, to really, you know, create the universe a better universe. And I think this workshop is actually a churning uh, of the ideas, churning of thoughts to come up with the coalitions, cooperations, coordinations, which we all talk about. So we b take this, um, uh, you know, a better future for, for the next generation. And I, I, I really uh, uh, think the value of this uh, call, uh, thing was we come up with the new ideas, we come up with the new coordination mechanisms, we come up with the new cooperation uh, 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 ways and coordinate the whole, converge the, our efforts together. And uh, as I usually say, uh, we may or may not have succeeded that much of seg segregation of waste, but let's succeed in aggregation of minds. And I think this is the uh, beauty of this, this, this uh, uh, workshop is we are aggregating our minds, our thought process, our way forward. Uh, so having said that, and I know I'm standing between the lunch and, uh, and, and all of you, but I really want to sincerely thank GIZ for supporting us to uh, the government of Repu uh, Federal Republic of Germany, uh, Global S uh, Solutions uh, uh, Policy Forum, Environmental Protection Program, UNEP, CEWD, our great partner, all the 35 cities and all the other partners and participants who have joined us uh, to last two days for this, this workshop. I think it could not have been possible without them. We have already clapped for my team, but I again want to clap all the organizers and the people who have, who have worked with us uh, during this. So, so give them a big hand. Um, and I, I hope during this Urban 20 uh, uh, discourse, circular economy, as you said, uh, that last Indonesia and somebody I think mentioned, uh, I think uh, G20 uh, 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 Indonesia hand over the circular was not a word in, in the G20 communique uh, in Indonesia. I hope with the U20 uh, sheer power here uh, uh, and the people who influenced the G20 communique will make sure that, and even Prime Minister talking about selling India's G20 communique when goes out, circular economy becomes a part of that word. That word circularity should come not only for India, for the world at large. So with that, thank you very much for joining us. Please join us for the lunch. Oh, we'll have uh, some photograph and uh, okay, and token of exchange. Thank you. Um, can I request you, Tesh, to give a thank you gift for our guests?
we would request uh, all the city uh, representatives to please come and join us for the group photo. <laughs> Have we given? Yeah, please come. Uh, we'll take the photo with all the city representatives. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then we'll have one with everybody once we're done with this. So, All right, okay, everybody, please wait two minutes. And everybody else, yeah, whoever wants to take a photo with our dignitaries, please come over here. And very quickly, we are not going to wait for you. <laughs> oh, everybody, everybody went away. See, if nobody moved quickly enough. <laughs> yeah, please come and take a photo. No, 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 please be, please be. Yeah. Come, come, pa you go in the front. Yeah. Please come for a group picture. We've had one on day one. This is for day two, please. Yeah. Can everybody please quickly come on yeah, the stage? Yeah, please come quickly. Yeah.